Вітаю. Hey would like to welcome you to the forum Teaching and Learning Excellence. I'm Yulia Sobel, I'm the manager of the educational projects in the British Council of Ukraine. I'm happy to see you here today and we hope that our forum will become a platform for us where we can discuss the issues of teaching and learning. And I would like to attract your attention to several housekeeping issues before we open officially our forum and listen to the words of welcome. Uh, first of all, I would like to inform you that there were a lot of people who wanted to participate in our forum and we would like to thank you for coming and joining us. Unfortunately, we could not invite everybody who wanted to join us. That's why we have online uh, coverage of uh, this event and you can see the cameras in the hall and we hope that the audience will join us through the online broadcasting and uh, they will be asking questions, put them to the speakers and we will try to announce those questions and the speakers will uh, each answer these questions and everybody will have an opportunity to speak. The forum is uh, named Ukrainian British Forum, and maybe you've guessed that we are going to have here British speakers. And if somebody needs translation, please take your gear for translation. And if you have not done that, please raise your hands, and my colleagues are going to provide those earphones to you. And because uh, we are covering this event in online mode, so please do not uh, move uh, too much around the hall. And if you need uh, the headphones, please raise your hands. Thank you. Now they will be providing the earphones to you. And uh, we would like to ask you to put your phones to the silence mode. We have simultaneous, uh, uh, simultaneous translation and uh, and uh, use this opportunity to listen to the translation as well. I would like to introduce my colleagues who will be able to help you if uh, you will have uh, any questions. Anastasia, who is behind, uh, and uh, my colleague Vita, who is sitting on my right. And during the breaks, during coffee breaks, during lunch break, you will be able to ask them about issues of interest to you. And definitely myself and my colleague Ludmila are going to be around as well. You have the agenda of this conference on the back of your pages, and that's why you can follow the timeline and you will know what happens when. And we are going to serve coffee during the coffee breaks on your left and behind us. And we are going to serve coffee breaks there and also lunches. We have not planned any, uh, you know, fire drills, but just in case you might hear the alarm this will be a real alarm. We hope that it's not going to happen, but nevertheless, uh, fire exits are on the left of the elevator near the wardrobe, near the cloakroom. And please don't use the elevators if fire alarm is activated and just use the staircase. I would like now to invite uh, to the floor the patriot of Ukraine, as we call him in the British Council, in spite of the fact that he is the British subject. And during several last years, the British Council has expanded the uh, number of activities which we are carrying out. New projects to uh, support reforms in Ukraine have been in, in implemented. And this happened thanks to this person, Simon Williams, the director of the British Council in Ukraine and in Kiev. So Simon, please, the floor is yours. Yulia, thank you. It's, uh, it will be hard to live up to um, that introduction, but I will, oops, I will try. Um, it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here today um, for today's meeting, and I'll just wait while you put on your headphones, those of you who need them. I shall hold this, I think. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here to the first Ukraine-UK Teaching Excellence Forum. Um, today's event is the first in what we hope and firmly believe will be an annual series of uh, fora with the aim of creating a national platform for experience exchange in teaching and learning excellence within higher education. 
so that the best UK and Ukrainian experiences can be shared and practices can be developed to improve teaching competence. We know that the government of Ukraine places a high priority on education reform. And the British Council has been pleased and proud to be supporting um, the implementation of those reforms through the law on education, the law on higher education and their implementation um, as part of an expansion of our programmes in Ukraine in education, science and culture um, since the Revolution of Dignity. And our aim is to identify those areas where UK experience is relevant um, and interesting, not necessarily the right experience, but relevant and interesting to look at for our Ukrainian partners. Our priorities in Ukraine are therefore those where we know through our talks with the government um, are um, those areas where the UK's experience may be interesting to look at. And this includes the development of effective, accountable and autonomous university management and governance, leadership within higher education institutions, quality assurance at both national and institutional level, improved English teaching, of course, with the British Council, and indeed English medium teaching within universities, and also support for student self-governance. We mustn't forget what universities are about. They're about the students. They're the most important customers of everything we do. From 2016 to 2019, we've run a three-year program on leadership development involving 40 universities. And I know many of you are here today, and it's great to see you, great to see many of our old friends and partners. Um, and we're very proud that that report has been, that project has been evaluated. Um, and in fact, this is the impact report um, on the program uh, carried out by an independent UK expert, Pat Killingly. Um, you've got copies of the report in your bags um, in English, and the Ukrainian version is available on the website. Um, so you can access it via a barcode. It's all very technical on the last page of the English report. So we encourage you to look at this. Many of you feature in this, many of your successes, your achievements over the last three years, as well as the learning lessons from that program. So we're very proud of that. That impact report identified the quality of teaching and learning within universities as one of the continuing priorities for institutional development. Staff development functions within universities are key drivers within this process to affect institutional change. And so therefore, jointly with our UK partners, Advance HE, Great, very pleased to have our partners here today. Um, over the summer, we conducted some initial needs analysis to look at the state of things in the field, looking at the quality of teaching and staff development. And in all discussions with our university partners, um, and many of you were parts of those discussions, improving teaching and learning was identified as a critical need um, in order to prepare students most effectively for the employment market and for their future lives. Key and urgent areas for development were identified. Particular concerns were raised around the lack of expertise and experience and maybe confidence um, in modern student-centered teaching practices within universities and also in using technology effectively for learning. The findings of that report show some areas of great practice um, and some excellent initiatives that are already going on within Ukrainian universities. And we're going to hear about some of those today, which will be really fascinating. But from that in needs analysis, we've um, picked out and identified um, the areas to inform our new program of support for higher education reform in Ukraine. And today, we're really happy that we will be launching a new year, three year program focusing on the development of teaching excellence in Ukrainian universities. The programme will be delivered in partnership with the Institute of Higher Education of the Academy of Pedagogical Sciences of Ukraine and with the support of the Ministry of Education and the National Agency on Quality Assurance. And it's great to have our partners um, here today. Now, you'll hear much more about this later today, so I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but you'll hear more from my colleagues. But over the next three years, we hope to involve 30 universities. I hope that many of you will be amongst those 30. Um, we hope to involve 30 universities to support the development of their teaching and to establish centers of excellence around learning 
um, and also to train teacher trainers um, so that the, those universities will be able to cascade that improvement of teaching and learning throughout their own institutions and indeed to other institutions. We'll only be working with 30, there are many more universities in Ukraine and that's where coming back to this today's event, this time next year, uh, we will want to hear from the 30 universities, or this is the first cohort of the 30 universities, to share their experience with wider groups as well. So thank you very much for coming. Some of you great distances, some of you less distances, but thank you very much for giving up your day today. Um, I know the presentations and the conversations will be uh, really interesting, really stimulating, really exciting. We'll be announcing the details of the new program and how you can take part at the very end of the day. So you've got to stay the whole day if you want to find out about that. Um, but I know my colleagues will make sure that the day is comfortable and inspiring. Um, Yulia, you were very kind enough to say some kind words about me. Um, I should also say a huge thank you to Yulia and particularly to Ludmilla, who have driven and led and inspired and grown um, our education work with universities over the last three years. So um, this is sort of Luda's and Yulia's day, just as much as it is your day. So thank you for coming. Have a great day. Um, and we look forward to your contributions um, just as much as we hope that you will benefit from the contributions you hear. Jack you. Simon, thank you very much for this brilliant uh, speech and introduction. So, <clears throat> I'm actually Ludmila, for those who don't know me, uh, Ludmila Tesenka, and I, uh, I switched to uh, Ukrainian now, sorry. So, it's now time for uh, British colleagues to put on headphones. Shalom, colleagues. Dear colleagues, let me also to sincerely welcome you to the forum which is dedicated to such an important topic as teaching and learning excellence in the higher education. And as Simon said, this is the first event of our new three years program which is aimed at improving the quality of teaching and learning in the higher educational establishments in Ukraine. We believe that this forum will be a platform for exchange of the best practices to discuss what the university needs to improve the teaching and learning. And the, pro the agenda has been planned in the following manner. We wanted to start this event with discussing the question of why excellency of teaching is a priority in development of the European space of the higher education. We also wanted to look at the situation in Ukraine from the point of view of legislation and from the point of view of the practical experience and to hear to what extent this issue is important for the system of accreditation from our British colleagues. We are going to learn how the system of supporting of teachers and professors is working in their country at the national level, at the institutional level. And we are going to introduce to you the results of the survey, uh, the needs assessment, which uh, has been carried out by Barbara Dexter, independent expert this summer. And we are also also going to hear what is the experience of the Ukrainian university in terms of professional development. As Simon said, you have to stay to the end of this event to learn what we are going to offer the universities in the framework of the new program. We are ready to open the first session and I would like to uh, suggest that we use the following format. We have three speakers and we would like to suggest that each of them is going to give a short presentation up to 10 minutes each and then there will be a Q&A session. And if you have any questions during the presentations, please jot them down in your notebooks. And then we are going to open the questions and answers session. And you will be asking questions. And we expect the online audience also to join us and asking questions. And we will invite our speakers one by one. We And the speakers in the first first session are the members of the national team of the experts on a form of uh, higher education. And I would like now to invite to Svetlana Kalashnikova, the director of the Institute of Higher Education of the National Academy of Pedagogical Science of Ukraine, the member of the national uh, the team of the national experts of, for a form of the higher education. Uh, 
Good morning, dear colleagues. I also would like to start from thanking the British Council for the fact that this initiative and a very important initiative for Ukraine, which is related to the implementation of uh, the priority of teaching excellence, uh, was supported by them. And now we are opening a very interesting program, and it's very important f that uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it, it is a continuation of the leadership program, and we are continuing moving forward, and we have developed the synergy in these issues. And uh, I would like to inform you uh, about the following and also to put some emphasis and to emphasize the fact that the excellency in teaching and learning is a very important priority of the European space of the higher education and Ukraine as a partner and full-fledged partner and participant of this process uh, uh, is also keen on it and uh, thanks to this program we have implemented the tasks which have been formulated. Uh, this is the Bologna matrix and you can see here on the left uh, that at the level of the European communique in 2015 it was uh, uh, actually uh, expanded with this uh, dimension which is uh, named the quality of teaching and learning and this communique at the level of the context has uh, content has identified the following aspect uh, the content aspect of this issue Im improvement of teaching and learning and as a relevance of the improvement of the quality or student-centered programs. Also, it's very important for our standards of higher education, the results, uh, the outcome of the education and the evaluation of those outcomes. And there is a separate task, improvement of the teaching competencies and professional development of the teachers. In the Paris conference in 2018, this direction has been strengthened very significantly and was developed through a number of other priorities and you can see those here and those are the exchange of the best practices the emphasis on innovation emphasis on inclusiveness in teaching and the the European Forum has started to operate to improve the teaching in higher education. I'm going to dwell up upon it a little bit later. Well, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And you can see here on this slide that, that in this part, uh, it, which is screened by the chairs, unfortunately, there is a very important priority which we also have to implement in U into Ukrainian experience. And that's the following. The, the career growth has to be based in academic career based on the successful research and quality teaching. These should be two absolutely equal components of the current academic career. Uh, from the um, uh, uh, communique and the Bologna st uh, process started to monitor the results of this priority and this is only one example and here you can see the monitoring of the fact that whether there are national strategies not just national strategies of development of higher education but national strategies related to the improvement of teaching and this in particular a picture where uh, which we have to take into account how shall we move forward to develop the national policy to improve the uh, teaching uh, uh, qu uh, quality and the improvement of the new technologies in teaching in higher education. The priority has appeared as a key one in the European space and European community started to discuss very proactively these issues and also the research has been done in this area and in real practice uh, um, and as well this issue is being um, discussed and uh, two fora uh, in Europe have been taken place and the first one took place in Paris and the second one in Warsaw and uh, these are the pages of these events and there are a lot of very useful sources uh, practices institutional national practices uh, to resolve this global issue improvement of teaching in the higher education and also we are going to publish a presentation on the website as we normally do after our conferences and you'll be able to use all those links. At the first uh, European Forum in 2017 in Paris, the so-called European principles of teaching and learning excellence as we approved, there were 10 of them. 
those who were with us at the previous Bologna conference, at the time we already translated them and handed them out. I stressed everybody's attention on that, but also allow me now to stop a little bit on these things and maybe also in the aspect of our experience. You see that the first principle accentuates on higher education uh, that should be directed uh, at forming active citizens except professional competences. And here we have some specific achievements uh, with new standards for higher education. Over there, a huge part is formed at forming general competences. The student-centered approach that we already know about. In many universities uh, in the West, uh, the institutional strategies are simply directed at performing this task. Except the general strategy, there is also the strategy for improving teaching. And I want to believe that after the end of our program, at least those two universities which enter the program are going to have at least a strategy in the end and at most uh, centers of excellence for learning and teaching. Of course, that's an ambitious task that we put before us. Among other important principles you see, I'm not going to stop, maybe some accents. A sixth principle here. It is important to emphasize that if Europe has come to this problem of uh, improving teaching for a somewhat different reason than us, and it's important to understand that their key motivation was to put the teaching excellence on the main level as research in the universities. We now have two tasks before us that have to be solved in parallel. It's uh, strengthening research competences of our universities, and at the same time, we're going to jointly move at the improvement of our teaching excellence. Among other things which are also important, you see here that uh, there is this conscious understanding that this task cannot be solved separately on some separate level. This is a whole synergy of uh, national events and national efforts, institutional and individual. And this is how a program is projected, the one that we're going to present, and we're also going to work on all three levels. There are lots of sources now, rather new sources, directed at solving this issue, and I actively call on using those. I'm only going to position one uh, source that I really like. Even though it's of 2013, it's very telling, and in, it was proposed to have 12 specific recommendations to the universities what they should do when we're talking about uh, teaching excellence. These are very important accents here because we're talking both about the policy for the support of professional growth and also the availability of strategy for the development of excellence and also on the level of universities to have serious opportunities for professional development and internationalization and digitalization and also uh, awards and also the evaluation, this evaluation and uh, con development of academic career based on real results uh, and uh, teaching excellence. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to implement this successfully. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Svetlana. Allow me to invite to the floor uh, Oleg Sharov, who is the General Director for the Directorate of Higher Education and Adult Education Ministry, Education Science of Ukraine. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, allow me uh, to speak on behalf of Minister of Education and Science, Anna Novosad, and her greetings go to all the participants of today's meeting. The Ministry is aware of the significance of excellence in teaching and believes that today it is one of the strategic tasks to develop higher education in general. In my presentation, I would like to dwell on several issues. How the problem of improving teaching excellence is an opportunity so improving teaching access correlate with the efforts of the Ministry and the whole state machine, so to say, in particular in legislation development. At first, allow me to show you several slides which are more or less ideological rules showing what are the stage, what is the stage that we're in, in our development. In 2014, we had a system of higher education which 
was under pressure of uh, centralization in higher education management. And actually, the first task of 2014 was the new version of the law Ukraine on higher education. This was the return to the basic concepts of updating higher education according to European standards. I'm also going to illustrate uh, that we have some significant success in this area, but we also have to understand that the potential, the speed and acceleration that the events of 2014 gave to us are now becoming exhausted today, and we need to have another impetus to move f further forward. So the task for the following period is to rethink the role and task of universities in general for the economy, state and society. I'm talking about a whole set of various issues and instruments, ideas, and intelligence potential innovations. Finally, our goal is actually the inclusion into the global mainstream of the aspiration for excellence of the universities. If we look at the criteria of European University Association about university autonomy, there are fields where in five years we have achieved undoubtable success, but there are also fields where we have serious gaps remaining. As for academic autonomy, in practically speaking, we solved all issues except one, which would be forming those. But with regard to our Ukraine mentality, I think that this remains even for 2019-2025. As for organizational autonomy, we have achieved some serious movement, but we also have a great drawback because involving stakeholders into governance, unfortunately, we didn't have it and we still don't have it. And I think this is going to be the first item on the menu of serious legislative initiatives in 2020. As for HR autonomy, which among other things, is connected with teaching excellence as well. We have more minuses than pluses here, as you can see. Yes, we can. We have recruitment and dismissal. We have the rules for academic career, but actually, these rules of academic career, even though they are present, they are insufficient. They do not provide an opportunity to constantly develop and to have remuneration for that development. That is why they are there, but actually, they are not efficient. And presently, we do not have any rules for the number of teachers in universities or the obligations on, in the university. We do not uh, actually do any work any with any definition. And also the financial autonomy, where except deposits, I think it would be an exaggeration to talk about successes. So presently we have this idea of Ministry of Education Science, which actually had to be sold in the following period. That is why presently uh, there is one law draft in the Verkhovna Rada, then also there is a range of other law drafts being prepared, in particular about improving the system of finance and management higher education. First of all, it is oriented to a range of these issues. Apart from that, according to the law on budget, there are amendments being prepared to the financing system. Uh, the transfer to formula financing. This might be a lower, uh, the document lower in level than the law, but it might can already solve a whole range of maybe not global, but very, very pertinent issues, like, for example, defining the amount of uh, people working or the budget of the universities, or, for example, a well-known uh, uh, regulation 1134, so, and other changes. Another topic would be the updating of uh, study programs. First of all, I would like to say that teaching excellence is possible in case of the excellence of study programs. If you have bad study programs, we're going to have teachers, celebs, who are not, not going to provide any synergy and effect for the education. That is why uh, updating study programs is a constant process. That's true. During the last five years, we have developed uh, some new study programs and uh, standards uh, on competency-based. Uh, competency we have things to do, but we have done a lot. But now we have this very interesting obstacle which, has, which many universities aren't aware of. I'm looking at the materials of the first accreditation according to the new procedure in National Quality Assurance Agency, and we can see it. A study program is good is not when it is stable and hasn't been changed for 10 years. Those who say that cannot have, uh, uh, I mean, you cannot really make a program that would work for 10 years. 
Today, the study program, which hasn't changed cardinally in three years, has been outdated. There have to be changes made every year with regard to the changes in life and research. So, of course, what excellence could we be talking about here? And this principle of systematic review of study programs is something that uh, people are only starting to become aware of in a lot of universities. Very often in the universities, this understanding still remains just on tops of Ukrainian management and it and the teachers and heads of chairs are not aware of it. I also have to say that starting from January 1, 2020, new agency, qualification agency is starting to, uh, to work and we're counting on developing a professional standards. By the way, the ministry already has a working group on developing a professional teaching standards for its university. Uh, we are going to solve the issues of harmonizing this uh, teaching standards with the professional ones and also development of dual and distance edu education. Our task is in five to six years to be ready. And here we shouldn't have illusions. In five to six years, we are not going to implement module and personalized study programs. That's the following task as soon as we've uh, solved that. But in five or six years, we need to have the grounds to move in this direction. As for the standards, uh, this table is a little bit out dated. We have 106 standards which are approved. Uh, all were sent to, uh, all that were sent to the National Agency are now approved. Uh, there is also 15 more standards pending. The process is ongoing, maybe not at the speed that we would have liked, but at least 8 to 10 standards uh, a month, except the vacation periods. That's something that we can work on and approve. Also, I would like to say a couple of words about the national qualification system. This national system is important to ensure teaching excellence in two aspects. On the one hand, a teacher prepares someone who gets education for certain work. Maybe they're going to work at different work. But for certain work, for certain qualification, they prepare them on the one hand. On the other hand, there is a qualification of a teacher himself, which, let's say, one of the important uh, moments for it would be the self-improvement, which allows to achieve that excellence in teaching. I have already said that the National Qualification Agency starts working. I also would like to say that this year we renewed the National Qualification Framework. Uh, running a bit ahead, I would like to say that the following year it's going to have a following update according to law 2299. But you can be sure immediately over there there wouldn't be any radical changes. There may be uh, some structure, but in context this qualification framework has been updated and it meets contemporary European standards. Maybe in three or four years we'll have to improve it again, but at least in 2020 all these improvements would be structural. We have a professional, professional standard for primary school teacher, and you know this st This is a standard we will learn from our mistakes. This is the case when, uh, uh, when new wine is in the old uh, barrel. And uh, this is not a good thing to do. And hopefully the National Qualification Agency is going to approve the new structure and the requirements to professional standards. And we're hoping that the standard of higher education teacher is going to comply with the new structure and the vision of this document. And I would also like to note that on the 21st of August, we, the Cabinet of Minister approved this order of uh, CPD for teachers. This is a long-term document. Uh, I have no illusions that everybody felt that two or three years are going to pass this before everybody feels that document, but this is a very important one that is going to determine for the activities and for the improvement of um, teaching professionals. The following topic that no doubt pertains to teaching excellence. Here I would take away a small part of the report from Mikhail, I hope that he's not going to be very offended. This is about accreditation and quality assurance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in five years, we have finally clearly diagnosed and dealt with the inefficiency of previous accreditation system. Its inefficiency five years ago was actually clear. It wasn't really clear what we have to do. We passed this stage when the accreditation of specialization study programs was done on based on unverified uh, parameters for education and teaching, uh, student training. The national agency, I have to compliment it a lot because ev many people are pushing to do at least some accreditation according to old system. Uh, and the, they were principally into that is probably the most important 
step in this insurance. The agency started working according to the new rules and new procedures and today develops the accreditation of study programs and their external quality assurance. It has also the task to develop independent institutions and uh, 2299 is going to ensure the refusal from state standard. Thanks. And for the future, of course, uh, we are going to introduce institutional accreditation, accreditation based on evaluation of internal uh, quality assurance systems, including the cooperation of the stakeholders' internationalization. And just a small remark here. Yesterday on Facebook, I, there is one discussion developing that the national agency was doubted whether they actually have this internal system. Quality relation, you know, this is a normal thing. Uh, until today, each uh, university used their own regulations and one article of the law for that. I think the development of understanding of all this and holding some national events on internal quality assurance systems, uh, realization, implementation of those developments that were done in the range of Erasmus supported pro programs about internal quality assurance, that's a very complicated task for the following five years. In general, I would like to note that today we have moved to a new ideology in evaluating the quality of higher education. And the key for us here was be uh, moving from control to development and improvement. And this consulting function that is now born by accreditation commissions probably the first but on this work, but I have to say that the educational uh, establishments are a bit complained. The accreditation be has become more important. Well, but you know, consulting is more important than inspection. Unfortunately, I think you'll just have to accept it as a fact. Second, we have moved from the framework of uh, quality to quantity to quality parameters, and this is going to require constant um, qualification improvement, also separate parameters, improving the integral development of. Um, higher education and finally from the monopoly of the state we will move to the synergy of equally important partners and here i have been refer referring to 2299 as a law well 2299 demonopolizes accreditation this demonopolization has already started just that uh, that month uh, uh, the cabinet of ministers has Im approved international accreditation agencies whose certificates uh, are recognized in Ukraine and every year we are going to renew this list according to the register. But of course we have the system of independent evaluation institutions to develop in Ukraine and this is going to be very responsible, very complicated. I hope you know, don't think it's simple, but institutional accreditation having the right for self-accreditation for a certain category of study programs. This is something that is already at work now. In general, if we talk about uh, quality assessment, I would like to say one more thing before moving to the topic of teachers. There is also the topic of licensing. I wouldn't want licensing to be viewed in the context of excellence because licensing means ensuring minimal quality and safety. Excellence is accreditation. In licensing and accreditation they have different target functions and again law 2299 is reworking the system of accreditation in higher education. You know what in 2014 the law on higher education was approved. Everybody was saying that this license and accreditation system is actually impossible and we just cannot do work like that anymore. But uh, what if it, if it weren't for consensus, at least we reached national compromise about how we could do it. But it wasn't available in 2014 and I see many faces of those who then participated in the working group for the new law and I think they're going to confirm it. Within five years period, we were able to develop the concept on accreditation and I believe that it is, will be very effective whether it will be a consensus or the consensus or national compromise on licensing. As far as the teachers are concerned, the issue of teachers in the university is the issue of strategic development of the higher education and I'm not going to reveal a secret. It's on the on the, on the the side of the cabinet of ministers. The KPIs for the deputy minister of Studney is the increase of the salaries of the 
teachers and scientific research workers of the universities for you to understand what is the basic criteria, main criteria in this case. But the salary cannot be increased because we have the teachers and scientific research workers. And at, pres at present, these salaries should not be just raised, but the uh, teachers have to improve their contribution. If the teachers do not provide uh, value to their students, uh, well, might not be needed by us at all. We stopped um, assessing the uh, 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 the work of the teachers uh, on the old qualifications, but now we are looking at uh, the scientific and professional proactiveness of uh, in the work of the teachers. Everybody feels that, and all the teachers actually have been arranged according to five, seven, ten uh, items in the list of scientific and teaching activities. And then we are going uh, to, uh, to uh, take into account the professional proactiveness, and we have to discriminate whether these uh, people have to whether these components have to be complementary or they might be different for different teachers. Some professors or teachers are just informing about the results of their research work to the students, and other teachers are mostly teaching, and science, scientific research for them is modernization and the support of the quality of the educational process. And it's nice if people have a result of 50-50, but these people are not numerous. Uh, and now we are looking at the question whether certain categories of uh, teachers should not be considered scientific research workers and teachers. Sometimes uh, it's easier to tell people that they are just teachers and that's not too bad. Or just uh, this person should constantly lie that they are doing some research work which they are not doing in reality. And that's why we have to uh, we gradually to evaluate the work of the teachers in a deeper fashion uh, to, uh, by looking at their productiveness and the outcomes of teaching for their students. At present, we have to build the system of monitoring of the employment, and in 12 months' time, we are going to develop this framework, and it will provide the results in three years. We started a pilot project, and now in the secondary schools, we are s and higher education, we are collecting the information about the um, monitoring of the employment of the graduates of the pedagogical specialities. It's going to be a pilot project, and then we are going to roll it out. In a number of universities, the universities uh, stopped uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, being apprehensive of the monitoring of the employment of uh, the uh, graduates. And the uh, the program, well, the uh, the competition while the teachers are uh, being hired to the educational establishment uh, and uh, this is considered to be the prestigious process and uh, unfortunately it's not paid properly. And uh, the scientific research work uh, has to be done on a certain level of quality, but unfortunately it has an impact on the uh, teaching of uh, the professors. And uh, the evaluation has to mm, to to consolidate the evaluation of the teaching practices of the uh, uh, lectures and also the uh, review and evaluation of their scientific research work. And uh, this is also the question of the research, the integrity of the um, research work. And our goal is to uh, to to uh, to actually retain this stuff in our universities so that they do not vote for immigration but staying in the universities. The uh, draft law 2299 is uh, being discussed in the parliament and the committee, standing committee of the parliament while looking at this law have approved the proposals uh, to the amendments for the second reading and it has been sent to the discussion in the session hall of the parliament of Ukraine. We hope that this uh, law, draft law uh, would be 
approved by the Parliament uh, during this session of the Parliament. And there are a number of uh, clauses which are very important for us. And we have to do a lot to make them working efficiently starting from September next year. And there are a lot of issues which are to be uh, useful for development of the system of education in the future. But we can see that this draft law is being supported by uh, the community. And the community understands that within the five years, uh, these problems uh, are to be resolved. Also, we are working on the draft law on the management and financing of the uh, educational establishments of the higher education. And the first step in financing is being underpinned by the law, by the indicative costs. And the formula of indicative costs is simply what uh, has to, had to be applied many years ago. We are a little bit late with that. But we have to change the status of the budgetary institutions and provide them financial autonomy. And as far as the governance is concerned, its involvement of the external stakeholders in the governance, but gradual changes are to be implemented inside the universities. And on the agenda, we are developing the draft law, uh, draft law on the adult education and improvement of qualification. And also there is another draft law of amendment, amendments uh, to the law on higher education. It's at a stage of the scientific stuff and personnel, and we are working on it. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. Alec, thank you very much, but the questions are going to be asked after the third presentation. And I would like to invite Mr. Mikhailo Vinitsky, the head of the Secretariat of the Quality Assurance Agency. I would like to thank you very much, first of all, for for all the compliments which we have heard from Oleg, uh, from the previous speakers. And uh, we are very happy about the fact that, that the activities of the national agency uh, is uh, uh, fitting into the main direction of the work of the Ministry of Education. And we are happy about that, that we do not have any conflict situations. Uh, and we are complementing each other in our activities. Uh, it is true. Well, I am not going to use the logo of the National Agency, and this is for purpose. We should use these not only for the official uh, presentations of our plans or reports, but we also have to discuss these issues to to think about these issues. And uh, Ms. Yeremenko, the deputy head of the National Agency, uh, can give you the official point of view. But I would like to share with you my uh, personal things on uh, uh, personal thoughts of teaching excellence. They have not uh, been yet included into the official documents. And uh, for this conference, uh, uh, will be very important for us to discuss uh, the approaches uh, to the solution of these issues. And uh, I'm still under the impression on the uh, yesterday's report on PISA, and uh, this is about the secondary education. But nevertheless, certain things which took place yesterday actually opened my eyes to the fact that uh, things uh, which we consider to be personal opinion of the teachers or the staff of the ministry or the agency, in this case, uh, uh, are to be underpinned by the quantitative information and assessment. But unfortunately, now we do not have a lot of data on the higher education which will support and underpin uh, the uh, statements. And we have to collect this data. And one of our tasks is to collect this data for accreditation. And mm, in this well, I have only eight slides, so don't worry, I'm not going to talk long. I would like to, to discuss what is the quality university education. Not everyone understands it uniformly. We, are very, we, we very often say that this is what provides the employment in accordance with the speciality, which was uh, 
attained by the student, by the graduate. And this is one of the aspects, but I would like to tell you that we are now thinking in Soviet terms, which still is a heritage, Soviet heritage. But quite often we forget about another role of the university, which I am going to discuss here, because it's closer to teaching excellence. And when we are talking about the improvement of the educational programs about the curricula, Soviet heritage is the uh, 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 well, is about universities uh, teaching and the Academy of Sciences doing the research. And uh, this brings about certain uh, results and outcomes, and we are still um, working under this impression. And uh, Simon and Ludmilla and the representatives of the British Council and the colleagues from British will excuse me if I share my experience of uh, studying in uh, the University of Cambridge in Great Britain. and. Uh, it, well, the teaching is not uh, uh, the, the greatest there. It's a great scientific research center, but if we are talking about teaching and high quality teaching, which I was provided, uh, well, my experience gives me a right to tell that uh, sometimes we uh, are providing higher standards of edu of teaching as in the each, uh, uh, in comparison with the uh, international uh, research centers. Sometimes I'm t telling uh, my students that you are lucky to uh, to take bachelor's programs in Ukraine because the bachelor's program have to teach people something. Unfortunately, we do have problems with the master's level. I'm not going to take a talk about the postgraduate level. So we have to discuss uh, these two levels, uh, which I've mentioned before, uh, very thoroughly. And we have to talk about consolidating uh, the uh, research and education. That's a problem which we have to resolve. But the bachelor program is a phase when the person is still studying, developing the uh, mode of thinking, and uh, some of the Ukrainian teachers do it quite well. So, uh, Oleg, uh, the previous speaker mentioned that the, 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 there are star teachers and uh, we have to improve the program level and uh, actually so that uh, these uh, stars will be actually uh, consolidated into a constellation. In 2016, we uh, have amended the law on higher education. You know about it. And this is about terminology. Quite often, uh, people were asking, why do we change the terminology? Higher educational um, uh, establishment uh, has been renamed. And we did not discuss it sufficiently because this terminology change is not simply a question of a small cosmetic change which brought about uh, uh, the workload of the civil servants who have to rewrite all the subsidiary legislation. But when we are talking about te learning, uh, well, this as 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 some. As some it has a very deep content. It is derived from the world uh, of, you know, teaching the truth. And there is a practical, correct mode of doing certain things. Uh, when we were going, uh, when we were talking about uh, the uh, higher uh, learning institution, we were talking about the development of the specialist who will be employed in the labor market. And uh, in uh, well, we have the curriculum. This curriculum is divided into four years. The entrance here is the inputs. Inputs, and these are the students. And uh, Inside, in this pipe, the students are going to learn all sorts of disciplines. And they will, uh, and after this process, we will check and actually make sure that they've learned something. And then at the uh, outgoing phase, we will see the specialist. The system works quite well if there are two components. The first component is the uh, conscious student, and the second component is working uh, in accordance with the speciality. But we have a problem here. Well, usually our uh, 
students enter the university when they are 17, and they do not think about the profession they are going to acquire for the rest of their life. And the second thing is that the graduates are not always working in accordance with their speciality. This model works when we are talking about the physicians, doctors, maybe engineers, but it doesn't work. It's not efficient if we are talking about the humanitarian, social sciences, economics, and things like that. But we have to understand that this is half, almost half, of all our students and graduates at present. Uh, the element of teaching and uh, learning should be uh, uh, rethought. And the institution of higher learning and learning uh, is derived from the world, uh, word the world in Ukrainian. And this is uh, the university is the place where we uh, actually form the outlook of the students. When we are talking with Yegor uh, Stadny, we quite often are joking and we are saying that the quote from the pre uh, president, ex president of the Harvard University, is quite interesting. The university education has to help the students to acquire the skills which will uh, help them in their sixth job, sixth employment, not necessarily for the first one. And here we are talking about the skills which are about the soft skills, which are universal, no, uh, irrespective of the speciality. And this was said by the ex-president of the Harvard University, who understands quite well of the, the uh, this direction of improvement and uh, excellency. And the university is the place where the, uh, the outlook of the world is being formed. And we we need three components for that. First of all, we have a different audience, and these should not be a lecture halls, but this should be a space where there is a opportunity to carry out the interesting discussions, exchange of experience, and horizontal communication. Nobody cancels the necessity of laboratory. It's the place for research, but not only in natural sciences, but this is a place where we are verbalizing the new knowledge and uh, this is a humanitarian laboratory as well if we are talking about two components uh, uh, Oh, I mean the uh, lecture audience and laboratory so we are also we have to think about the environment and the university has to create a situation when the student feels himself or herself a member of the community and British Council helped us a lot within the last two years to to educate the leaders the students leaders and we have to continue these programs in not only when we are talking about the improvement of teaching but also in terms of creating this uh, students community and university communities. So I have to complete my presentation. And we at present in the accreditation criteria have certain things which deal with a specific improvement of teaching. And we have to pay attention to those. First of all, in the fourth uh, uh, criteria, uh, we talk about the forms of methods of uh, teaching and learning uh, are promoting the attainment of the goals of the programs. In the accreditation pro process, we are talking about the goals of the educational programs. Unfortunately, in a lot of universities, they have not been formulated uh, uh, properly, specifically. And it means that the goal of the program is to provide the job for the teachers. And this is not a appropriate way to deal with this issue. And uh, this has to be changed within the next five years. Uh, this is one of the elements which is going to be changed quite quickly. And uh, the institutions which provide the educational, organizational information, consultants, uh, consultative uh, support uh, for uh, the students uh, and uh, this uh, th the students have to be uh, have to be uh, um, 
the students have to influence the educational process and uh, the students are very important stakeholders. Engagement of the students to the process of accreditation is one of the cornerstones which will change our paradigm. And in the academic community, the culture has to be developed, the culture of quality. How it is possible to measure the culture? It is not possible to measure it, but it has to be present in the universities. And I think this is an element of the creating of center of excellence, which we have to discuss. And this criteria number six is about the human resources. And everything which is written here in this criteria, I'm not going to read it to you, is about improvement of the teaching excellence and improvement of the teacher. And we understand that this is only a beginning today. These criteria have been developed to create a basis for the future development. We understand that this year uh, it, uh, will, it is not going to be, uh, you know, evaluated very precisely, but uh, we have to move to the implementation of this paradigm. And after we clean up the system, we will decide where the system of autonomous university is going to be directed. I would like to complete with this, but just demonstrate this slide to you. And I am sure that improvement of our system of higher education at present uh, cannot uh, uh, achieve the task of may all the universities absolutely the same. We have to create different types of uh, higher educational institutions. Uh, and. Uh, all, 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 the institu all the higher institutions uh, higher education institutions cannot be absolutely equal. And we will have just a highest league of certain institutions, like in Great Britain, France, and other countries, USA. And among the others, there should be differentiation. And among the top league, there should be differentiation. And we have to think about teaching universities, research universities. So each university has to be differentiated and the place of student and teacher in each university should be defined. And this is some piece of work and I call on you to talk about it and to think about it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for taking up too much time. Thank you, Mikhailo. Thank you for your inspirational speech. It seems to me that this is how we should uh, organize our forms and this should be a platform for discussion. Uh, so let's add a bit of light into our life here. And Svetlana Oleg, we don't have that much time for questions and answers, but still, we're going to dedicate five minutes of the break for that. Mm, we don't offer any coffee, actually, so it's going to be enough, these 10 minutes, but we are going to have lunch. As for the questions, please introduce yourself, please ask your question brief and use the microphone because otherwise the interpreters are not going to hear your question. We have people with microphones in the room. Yes, Nastya, Olga. If there are questions, well, please uh, don't be shy. I can share my microphone if you want. Vladimir Bokhrushin, I have a question about some contradiction uh, between the uh, topics of our uh, presenters about the features of accreditation. Uh, law 2299, which might be approved already this week, says that accreditation becomes obligatory. Mikhailo says that accreditation has to remain voluntary. So, could you please comment on that? Uh, was that a question to whom? To Oleg and Mikhailo. And maybe Svetlana also might comment on that. Thank you, Voldemar. I don't see any contradictions here. Sometimes the same things are just called in different names. I talked about it as a demonopolization of accreditation that is because as such concept as state diploma simply disappears, these diplom diplomas can be given out by anyone, uh, those who have the respective license. But uh, the general European practice, when the diplomas are handed out, then the higher education institution receives a confirmation from a certain accreditation institution, which can be different, that they are really ready to give out this uh, diploma. So 2299 envisages four possible options for a university. Uh, 
so it's either through national agency for quality assurance or with the international accreditation institutions it works and also i'd like to uh, i would have to say this is independent from the national agency they cannot give any indications to them then also the independent assessment institutions. I understand that uh, there is some element of dependency on the national agency, but I think that they will quickly become capable, and this just will just become be a formality. And finally, forcing, uh, and actually, we in two or three years will be able to talk about institutional accreditation, and then the institutions themselves will get accreditation. So we are talking about external insurance of an in, in, in internal insurance uh, so both external and internal traditionally this external one was the accreditation procedure but this accreditation is now demonopolized and there would be no obligatory accreditation in the national quality assurance agency Vladimir, thank you for the question because really it seems to me that here i wouldn't say that that we have misunderstanding here. We're actually looking at the process from different points of view. And uh, Alex said about demonopolization. Uh, I'm really concerned about the role of the national agency here. If the accreditation is a part of it as an obligatory element, I'm going to explain it. Now we have one of the concepts of this. Offered is declarative licensing. Uh, then obligatory accreditation during the first or second year after the study program was launched. So this is one of the ideas which, by the way, is based on a similar concept existing in the UK. In the UK, as the accreditation became obligatory, uh, we have the situation today when there is QA, well, actually, they used to, it used to exist, and there is Advanced HE. Advanced HE is a consultative institution which uh, provides consulting or recommendations to the university's development, and QA actually checks these standards. So, as a result, it just happens that there is inspection and there is consultative body and they're divided. Presently, it seems to me that we did something extraordinary here. The national agency, I would like to be proud of that. I think it's correct, but I like did pay attention to that. It's combination of consulting and non-consulting uh, uh, assessment. I'm concerned that if accreditation becomes obligatory, we might lose that element of consultative evaluation and become closer to the inspection. I don't believe that this is, it seems to me that this is just an issue that we still have to discuss. It's a question to us and to other agencies that are going to create, be created now. Uh, this is a wider issue. How on the level of management you can combine this uh, kind, or not really kind, but consultative role with the evaluation. In England and Wales, we didn't really measure it. We had to divide it. In Scotland, I think they have combined it. But you have to understand that the Scottish higher education system is much smaller than the Ukrainian one. And we still have to work on that issue and discuss on it. We also have to do some internal discussions. In this part, I would like to agree with Mikhailo, because personally, I am a bit concern that yeah there is some variability here but how ready we are for this variability today and uh, whether actually then we are going to lose uh, this wish to bring new paradigm into the external integration system because we're just going to have that into this traditional accreditation all this so in this part and uh, is not about national agency is for each of us so that we looked at this variability as much as possible so we don't just put up the task so so that they put up this max uh, task and so that we really thought about it and uh, so that this variability actually uh, helps us with the excellence of our programs more questions please Yes. Uh, dear colleagues, Valeria Milaeva, professor at Boris Grinchenko University and also a PhD in psychology. I have a question about people. Uh, 
question, maybe some comment about forming vision of a process for teaching and learning excellence. Actually, I feel certain concern at the moment when I enter the university as a teacher and from the very first moment I feel the situation of measurement, the situation of comparison and the situation of hyper responsibility for certain changes which are happening and which I'm not always aware of. Why I'm actually talking about it? Because we conducted some research, we've become aware that the wish to move forward in a Ukraine teacher is now much greater than the potential that it objectively has about this year. So I have the first part of the question whether we don't pay too little attention to preparing this driving force, this instrument of change of a teacher who is active today to the processes and expectations which you have for them. And another thing, whether we could find an opportunity to work out the research of this instrument and its improvement for the future projects that we are planning about improving uh, higher education colleges. So who is the question for? I would like to ask uh, all the speakers if you could comment on that. Because Oleg was talking about specific things and instruments that still have to take place. Mohailo actually gave us some hope that these instruments are going to work. And Svetlana might tell us how to do it specifically. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. As we now have this uh, framework, we'll have to keep to it. Presently, the Ministry of Education and Science works out on several projects which are going to envisage rather wide-scale training and new approaches both in teaching and in management of higher education. So for you to understand, the actual condition is uh, so that we have more than 10,000 people like that in the programs that are going to be prepared more or less and centralized uh, even though of course mm, it's about that so that's one thing another thing we also hope that today there are more opportunities and among the teachers themselves thanks uh, to the new procedure of continuous professional development they can independently ch choose the topics and the most convenient ways and uh, I'm far from thinking that today all universities are capable financially to help these teachers. Here it's a bit worse. But here we are also counting on certain instruments that we will be preparing at the level of ministry, but still without those uh, uh, universities and also the teachers won't solve that. Uh, just very briefly for me, because it seems to me that Svetlana has much more to say here. Uh, but I'll say the following. In the current composition of the management of the national agency, and the head of the secretariat, these are the people who are, let's say, the radicals, the talibs, in their belief into the uh, not autonomy of the university. So it means that the training and the improvement of competences and what we call teaching capital, first of all, is the task of an autonomous university with all problems associated with it and yeah, financial and human resources and structure and organization. But I think it's also important that we shouldn't be trying today to create better teachers for the country, you know? We have to find teaching excellence in the centers. And, and I mean, I'm a person who has been working in Kiev Mohila Academy for 17 years. I don't have to be a good teacher for Tchenko University. There should be an understanding that a teacher is good when he is good for the certain context. And uh, And the Shevchenko University chair might not be my, a match for a culture of Kiev Mohila University. So we need to have 200 separate units, unique autonomous 
communities and environments. It is in these communities that we have to improve in the context and the full program this teaching excellence. Agree. Uh, so actually, it has to correlate with the values and strategy of the university. And in other words, the solution of this problem in university is going to be unique. And the solution is only possible in systemic way, and the task of the national policy would be to facilitate this process. And our key task on the level of the university is to spur these good practices and a good important uh, a problem for us and the challenge is to have maximal exchange of these practices so uh, and uh, oh so there should be priorities for teaching included and uh, i am lacking today this exchange because in each university there are teachers that have can say something. It's just that we have to move towards each other, we have to exchange the experience. And uh, uh, policy has just an accompanying. Just one more question, colleagues, yes, very brief, and maybe it's going to be the last. And I really uh, hope that you're going to communicate during the break. So we're going to have one break, then we're going to have lunch. So please exchange your experience and keep communicating. Lisa Donachenko from Kharkiv National Medical University. Uh, Mikhailo's words about uh, the Taliban environment in National Quality Assurance Agency have the partial explanation and partial answer to my question. In this uh, law draft 2299, there is this provision that this, the international students cannot be taken in without uh, accreditation of the university, but this actually uh, gives a, a devastating blow to medical universities because it is planned to have master's students for 2021 in dentistry. There will be accreditation in 2021 and in 2022 these are the masters on, of MDs. Uh, so in 2020 and in 2021 there won't be any uh, International students taken in according to this law, will there be any transitory provisions or is it a strategy of the ministry to actually uh, to leave for these medical universities without new students? So the Ministry of Education and Science envisages there will be an opportunity that to, there will be international students of... Uh, so there will be an opportunity for those who uh, took in international students for study programs which are now not accredited but already uh, uh, two considerations to the trust students, they will continue with that. But then, of course, they will. You, this promise will have to be rejected because we have some concerns, really, that among such programs, there is something something really unacceptable. So yes, there will be trust students taken in, and uh, yes, thank you for the answer. Okay, very quickly. There is a microphone. And this is the last question, really. I'm sorry, but we really have to keep it to the time. I have the following question. The research of new Ukrainian schools has shown that uh, school principals are the biggest slowdown for the reform. It is hard to, it is the same for the universities. If the vice rector or rector don't uh, support the ideology, it's very hard to implement. So how are you going to fight that? Because I think that it is also going to be a problem, just like in secondary schools. First of all, I have to say that the research of new Ukrainian school concerned school principals. I'm afraid that among university rectors there are examples both better and worse. I would like to remind you that starting from the end of 2019, we have now rectors who have been managed for many years and they don't have the right anymore to be uh, selected. So, 
uh, now we are in a long-term seven-year period when those rectors, which have been rectors for a long time, have to uh, actually go from their post. This might cause negative consequences as well. Uh, we already see uh, that a big amount of uh, teams actually choose rectors which promise they come back to the past, which is impossible in principle. So we are counting that here the support of the reform. Uh, and for the minister, now there is a ministry task on the in the reforms to actually strengthen external stakeholders in university management. Thank you. I would also like to add that in this part, our mission is about the proposal of those programs and services that are going to help the development of management competence. Thanks uh, a lot to all the participants of the panel. And now I propose to have a small break. You know where the washrooms are. The water is here. Please come back in seven or eight minutes. And then we are going to have a session from the British colleagues.
Колеги, давайте будемо вже продовжувати через те, що час, ми не хочемо всіх затримувати. Будь ласка, повертайтесь на свої місця. Прохання повертатися на свої місця, ми будемо продовжувати. We had a great beginning of opening of our day and we continue our work and at the very beginning I would like to tell you what we are going to do next. Now the next session is dedicated to the British experience in teaching and learning. But uh, to, to begin with I'd like to inform you that during the forum we are going to use all sorts of new technologies and I would like to introduce to you the platform which we are going to use soon. You can now try to uh, enter this site and uh, we are going to carry out the online voting for the next session. Please start accessing this website so that you can understand how it works. Well, 3G doesn't work that well, so you can use the Wi-Fi and uh, park in guest and then you also have to check the box uh, telling that you agree to the conditions and terms and conditions and then the BC 2019 and then you can use it 
this uh, password, BC2019. At present, there are no questions because the questions are going to be offered to you a little bit later. But thanks to this platform, you will be able to ask questions, uh, write those questions to our speakers if it's more uh, convenient for you. And uh, if you are not apt to use the microphone, you can send your questions in writing through this app. And now, please uh, leave your phones, and we are going to use them for voting a little bit later. But now I would like to introduce to you the moderator of the next session, and this is Mr. Simon Williams. Ready? Okay. <laughs> Julia, thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the first session this morning, which was fascinating uh, and really interesting, really inspiring, um, was obviously looking, about, looking at the situation here in Ukraine in terms of uh, looking at teaching excellence as a priority for the European higher education area, looking at national policy and recent developments in the field, looking at teaching excellence and accreditation, and also hearing from you, some of you, some of your questions and concerns about how it will all fit together. But the next session, um, we would like to use to give you an overview of current UK experience in all of these areas. Um, and as we uh, started off by saying, uh, uh, we think that, you know, we hope that some of the UK experience will be relevant and useful. We're not saying it's the best. Um, I was particularly struck by the questions um, from the lecturer who said, you know, the worries about teachers being turned into instruments of measurement and having policy and my mother is a school teacher but comes from the generation that had to cope with national curriculum and had to marking and assessment and turning from a teacher into a regulator and a measurer and i remember the challenges she had so it, we must never underestimate the uh the challenges of change um, as well as the reasons for change and the benefits of change but we're very pleased to have with us here today two speakers from advance he um, and I'll just introduce them briefly, then I'll hand them over. So first, we're going to hear from Ian Hall, who is Head of Membership International at Advance HE. And he's responsible for Advance HE's relationships with the 56 member institutions um, outside the UK. And Ian also works with governments and ministries directly on national level, looking at teaching improvement projects around the world, um, working in countries such as um, Thailand, Lithuania, Egypt, and of course, Ukraine. Uh, he has a background in learning technology, so very relevant, um, and has worked on projects to support student-based learning and competency-based assessment by students of teachers within UK universities. We'll then hear from Julie Bulgy currens who is Managing Director of Higher Ideas and who is a principal of the Higher Education Academy in the UK um, and a recognised accreditor and consultant for the UK Professional Standards Framework. Um, Julie regularly undertakes international consultancy and has worked in across Europe in Malaysia, Australia, Oman, um, the UAE and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In 2007, Julie was awarded a prestigious National Teaching Fellowship, so congratulations for that, in recognition of her work in peer learning. So we'll hear from Ian and Julie um, about some aspects of the current UK system and the current UK landscape. Um, we will then have some time for questions at the end, and we'll look for questions coming from you through Slido, but also from the floor. Um, and um, I know that we will find the next two presentations um, interesting and stimulating. So, Ian, first, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Dobry den. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Ian Hall, um, and I'm afraid I can't speak any more Ukrainian, so the rest is going to have to be in English. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions for you, so if I could just ask... Yulia to bring up the Slido for me. This is the bit where you worry about being billed as a learning technologist or someone with a background in learning technology. So um, the question I have for you, I've got two questions. The first question is, are effective teachers born or made? And I'd like you to, to select your, your thoughts on, on the Slido app. Yes. 
So I think in the top we've got a counter, we've got 26 responses. I'm a little disappointed about the, the, the homogenous nature. Oh, we've got, we've got some, we've got some um, disagreement here, we've got a few people, but it, it appears within this audience, I'll give you a couple more moments, that we have a, a fairly general agreement that teachers are, are effective teachers are made rather than born. Um, so I'm going to wait, you've got five more seconds to reply. Okay, I'd like to move on to our, our second question for the morning. So this actually refers to a European Universities Association report which Svetlana referred to earlier. Um, and it's just about the number of uh, universities based on this survey that have got compulsory teaching training within Europe. So what percentage do you think, um, which percentage of universities do you think have compulsory training for their teachers or lecturers? Some differences of opinion I know on this question. Okay, five, five more seconds and I'll confirm later in my presentation uh, whether many of you have read the report or not. Okay, thank you. We're clustering, I think, on some of the higher areas, 37% um, being the most common, but also some going for kind of closer to, to half. Um, so, okay, if we could move on to the slides. Okay. Just while I bring this up, um, so my name's Ian Hall and... Um, Thank you very much to Simon for his introduction. Um, I work for Advanced HE, which, um, as Mikhailo hinted, uh, our role is as a quality enhancement body rather than as a quality insurance agency. We're based in the UK, but we work across the globe to improve teaching and learning, leadership and governance, and equality and diversity in higher education. We're a not-for-profit organization, and we're a registered charity. So our goal is really to work with higher education for the good of the public. We were formed last year, about 18 months ago, following the merger of the Higher Education Academy, the Equality Challenge Unit, and the Leadership Foundation for Higher Education. And I know many of you may have worked with the Leadership Foundation on the previous Leadership Development Project. So I'm just going to briefly start with asking the question, why? Why do we develop teachers? And, and when I'm talking about teachers today, I'm talking about those in higher education. All of the work we do is within universities or higher education providers. So if I talk about teachers, I mean lecturers, academics, professors, that kind of role. So to answer the poll earlier, I'm, there is agreement with you. The European Science Foundation research said that excellent teachers are made, not born. They become excellent through investment in their teaching abilities. And indeed, we did some research around 10 years ago called Dimensions of Quality, which looked at what impacted on the quality of the higher education experience for students. It was looking at the whole experience, not just teaching. But one of the findings of the report was that teachers who have teaching qualifications were found to be rated more highly than those who did not. And in fact, looking in detail at that, the teachers who had qualifications were found to be rated highly on every aspect of the evaluation of their students in comparison to those who didn't have that training. However, in most countries it is not compulsory to have training in teaching, in pedagogy, in order to teach in a university. In the UK, teacher training has been common for many decades for those who work in secondary or primary schools, but university level teachers have only relatively recently received training, and it is still not actually compulsory. And the EU A report recently noted that across Europe, training for teachers varies quite significantly. And the answer to the question is 37%. 37%, around a third of universities have compulsory teacher training in Europe. However, the nature of that training differs, so some of them, whether that's a very long um, comprehensive programme or a very short programme, it just means it's compulsory and there's still two thirds that don't have that. 
Before I finish this section, I'm just going to refer to two reports that we've published. So we regularly, as an organization, do research into higher education and look at the future, what future challenges there are for universities. And this is a piece of work uh, our former CEO did about the challenges of higher education tomorrow. And what she found in her research was that um, teaching and learning and the academic workforce were two of the key challenges that universities were telling her based on uh, interviews with global leaders. A similar study was conducted a few months ago, and we published it, uh, called On the Horizon. And again, you can see that similar challenges emerge. So we have student learning and the learning environment. Again, the academic workforce. But also up here, technology. Um, technology being a core part, obviously, of the student learning experience. So what I'm saying to you is that teacher training does make a difference. There is evidence to say that. And that universities are saying that it needs to happen, that it's a challenge for them. So what I want to talk to you today in more detail now about, and with, with the assistance of my colleague Julie, is about some of the UK experience. And we're actually going to also talk a little bit about outside of the UK as well. So to start with, I'm going to talk about some of the high level, the policy level work that's been done in the UK, what, that has driven what we actually do in institutions. So firstly, there have been a range of higher education reviews done in the UK that have emphasised the need to improve teaching. And I'm going to talk more about those in the moment. Some of you may also have heard of the TEF, the Teaching Excellence and Student Outcomes Framework. This is a, an assessment of teaching that was developed in the UK and launched for the first time in 2017. And it, it looks to measure teaching in universities and awards them gold, silver and bronze awards based on their results on the TEF. So you can actually find out whether a university is gold standard for its teaching. Now just to give you a comparison, the Teaching Excellence Framework was launched in 2017. The equivalent, in a way, on research, our research assessment exercise was first launched in 1986. So it took 30 years to get from measuring research to measuring teaching. Now, the actual measures that are used and whether they actually measure excellent teaching are quite contested, particularly within the sector. However, the principle of measuring teaching and bringing that to the forefront is, a, is I think, a very good one. Also within the UK, related to the higher education reviews, we have rising student expectations, particularly related to tuition fees. You may be aware that in the UK we have some of the highest student tuition fees um, across the world. And this has strongly influenced uh, students really viewing themselves more as consumers of, of university education rather than being learners. And therefore, they expect more from their experience. And related to that, we have a national student survey which evaluates at an institutional and a program level um, the quality of the student experience. And we have our quality assurance agency as well that mandates um, that uh, university teachers receive some training and development and that they're effectively uh, qualified for their roles. So what does this actually mean? Julie's going to pick, unpick this in a little detail for us in a moment. But in practice, most universities in the UK require a lecturer to complete a qualification or achieve a fellowship of hours, which is an, an equivalent qualification for teaching within two years. So if you get your PhD and get a new role as a lecturer, within two years you have to become qualified as a teacher. Otherwise, you won't keep your job. There are also development programs offered for experienced staff because offering programs just for new staff doesn't capture all of, all of the people who are teaching. These programs are underpinned by professional standards, which I will come, describe in a bit more detail in a moment. And we're now at a point where 51% of staff have got a recognised teaching qualification in the UK. So it's a long way to go, but from, you know, in a relatively short space of time, uh, we have actually got to around half of staff being qualified. So in practice, what does this mean as well? Um, we have national level teaching awards. So Simon mentioned, uh, Julie has a national teaching fellowship for her award on teaching, both for teachers and institutions. And we have professorships and promotions and reward based on teaching. So historically, to become a professor in the UK, that was based on your research output. There are now professorships based on your teaching too. 
And there's a little slide, just a picture here of the University of Huddersfield, the entrance to one of their buildings, which shows their TEF Gold Award, which shows that they were our inaugural Global Teaching Excellence Award winner, and that they've got the most professionally qualified teaching staff in England. So universities are using this as a competitive tool to show that they're making a difference directly to their visitors, to their students, and to their staff. So briefly, I'm just going to go into some history about some of the higher education reviews in the UK. Back in 1997, we had something called the Deering Report, which recommended that institutes of higher education began to develop or seek access to programs for teacher training. So it nudged universities in the direction of teacher development. Then in 2003, there was a report that said from 2006, all new teaching staff should undertake a teaching qualification that incorporates agreed professional standards. We didn't have those standards. So the organization I used to work for that formed part of Advance HE, the Higher Education Academy, was formed. And we developed these standards in consultation with the whole sector. So what do these standards look like? This is the UK professional standards framework for teaching and supporting learning in higher education. It's a mouthful. What we call it is the UKPSF for short. This framework describes the role of teaching and supporting learning in higher education, what people need to do to teach in higher education. And it describes different roles that people take. So it describes those that maybe uh, assist teaching, those who are lab technicians or librarians or teaching assistants, through to those who are regular lecturers teaching on a regular basis, through to those who have strategic or uh, management influence on lead, uh, teaching and learning. I'm not going to talk today in detail about what's in the framework, but just to give you an overview, there are essentially three dimensions or three parts to the framework. One is the area of activity, so this is what you do as a teacher, things like teaching and assessing learners. Then there's the core knowledge, so what you need to know about to teach effectively in higher education, and that includes things like your subject matter. So you can't teach chemistry if you don't know about chemistry. But it also includes knowledge of methods for teaching appropriately of your subject, and knowledge of appropriate learning technologies. And finally, professional values. So what you actually value as a teacher, things like um, encouraging participation in higher education. What the framework is used for is a range of things. Um, so people at universities use it to design staff development programs. So they can look and see, make sure that the required areas are covered. It's used to recognize staff. So we have our fellowship award, which people write applications against to actually demonstrate that they are an effective teacher. And we accredit staff development programs. So universities can award fellowships on our behalf if their programs meet these criteria. But it's also used for things like appraisals and promotions. And it can be used as a self-assessment tool as well. At the bottom, I've just got a little picture of uh, uh, the curriculum at the UCL, their ARENA scheme from University of College London, which has been aligned to our framework to demonstrate that it meets all the needs of these national standards. This is just a, a very quick snapshot of the growth of fellowship year on year. So from small beginnings, only 15,000 back in 2004, over 105,000 at the end of 2018. There's now over 125,000 fellows across the world, with over 6,000 outside of the UK, based in 90 different countries. So fellowship has taken hold, and even though this is called the UK Professional Standards Framework, because it was developed in the UK, it has now been used across the world, with many institutions in Australia, New Zealand, parts of Europe, Africa, um, America being accredited by us too. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of um, you know, why you might want to develop teachers, what the research says about that, and some of the approaches that have been taken in the UK, some of which you may want to pick and choose, and some of which I know are already being done in, in the Ukraine. Um, now, I realize I've talked about some of those in quite a high level, what, are, what these programs are or what we offer. What I'd like to do now is hand over to my colleague Julie as someone who has actually run these programs and delivered some of these in the UK and overseas to talk in a bit more detail about that.
Good morning, everybody. Dobra Den. I have had a role in a university where I was responsible for the strategic direction of learning, teaching, assessment, student experience. I've also had the same role at national level with Advance HE. But today I'm speaking really more from the perspective, as Ian has said, of somebody who would design and lead these programs. And having been on the receiving end of them myself as well. So what is it that we're really trying to do? And essentially, any of the programs are trying to move to a situation where we are using active, engaged learning. We're using methods and approaches that move away from a situation where the students are only hearing a fraction of what you're saying and being able to write down even less or perhaps a situation where they just can't pay attention for the period of time that's needed. We're looking for a far more engaged and exciting approach. Now, some people would say, well, that's just edutainment, entertainment in education. And maybe it is. Maybe it is a degree of edutainment. But if it gets their attention and gets them involved, then we know that their uh, learning, their attainment is going to improve. Now, one of our colleagues in the UK, Simon Lancaster, is a chemistry professor who's done a lot of work in developing his own practice and helps other people considerably. And Simon poses uh, a challenging set of questions. He says, how many chemistry lecturers approach their teaching in the same way they address their research? Do they consult the literature to establish best practice? How many academics would seek out the same dated instruments and techniques that they used as, te as students? Do they then believe that teaching the way they were taught is state of the art? And we do know that many, many teachers will teach either the way that they were taught or the way that they wish they had have been taught. And we need to be able to move on from that. So we talk about contemporary pedagogies in a range of ways. We're always emphasizing active, engaged learning that's student-centered. We talk about trying to empower our learners to make meaning for themselves, to construct an understanding that makes sense to them, not the way that we construct it for ourselves as experienced academics. And they may do this within a contemporary shape by doing things, by learning from those experiences and discovery, by engaging in projects or working with other students. And of course, that places us in a very different position. We become a facilitator. We're not the ones standing at the front of the class. Uh, we're not the sage on the stage. We become the guide on the side. And that's quite challenging. It's quite challenging for us. It is a different paradigm to be able to think, OK, I'm not just going to stand here and present the knowledge. And if the students are very good, I might share a little bit more of my knowledge with them. Now, it doesn't really matter how we shape this. You'll see these lists appearing in many, many different guises. And they're all saying the same thing. Whether they're labelled traditional and contemporary or teacher-centred, student-centred, whether it's about passive or active learning, surface or deep, we're trying to get from this column to this column. So for example, learning in a very passive way as a learner, you'd be told things, you'd listen, you'd try and reproduce that information. Or you're going to be involved in doing things where you'll create that meaning that I was just speaking about. Our assessments can move then from the traditional exams and essays. And it doesn't matter how much we talk about innovation in assessment. Most studies still show that it's about 80 to 90% use exams and essay questions. And that's a real sadness 
in higher education as opposed to moving into projects and presentations and annotated bibliographies and portfolios and all sorts of things. So we're looking for something more. Now, some colleagues a few years ago looked at what were high impact pedagogies. What sort of pedagogies and impact strategies, if you like, what made a difference to student learning? And they found that encouraging students to make their own visual representations, whether it is writing notes or whether it is using mind maps or whatever, works really well. Similarly, anything that involved inquiry, it could be as high level as some sort of simulation or it just could be a case study. Problem-based, project-based learning, gaming. Now, I have some stories to tell you about the use of gaming, but I won't do it right at this moment. Team-based learning, just-in-time teaching. Are you familiar with the expression just-in-time teaching? It doesn't mean that we're up the night before still trying to finish our slides. It means that in any program of study, we reserve some time right at the end of the course where students will tell you what they want you to cover because they didn't understand it or they missed it or you missed it out. So the just in time is that you've still got time to cover anything that they desperately need uh, you to do. Flip to learning. Well, I'm old enough that I used to call flip learning preparation for the seminar, but now somebody else has invented it and called it flip learning. But essentially, the idea is that the students will engage in some work before the lecture. So they're coming to the session prepared with knowledge that you can then discuss and tease out their understanding. And if we use technology, that's terribly exciting. And if we get them to do presentations, then maybe that's even better. But the idea is that the flip is in how they approach the knowledge. And narrative pedagogies, which are often used in the very practical professions where we're encouraging students to bring their stories and to analyse them. Now, the key essentials here are really all about this active, experiential, reflective stuff. But they're also about assessment and I'm going to talk about assessment for learning as much as assessment of learning and I've talked about the things that we use. Now turning to assessment briefly we know that assessment is really important as a driver but we have to remember as David Bowd has said that students can't escape bad assessment. If we design bad assessment, the students are stuck with it. And so it is a really important thing. And Phil Race says that nothing that we do is more important than our assessment and the feedback that we give. And a rather sobering note is that we have found consistently since we introduced our national student survey, which is given to every third year or final year student in a degree in the UK, that students are more dissatisfied with assessment than with anything else. So that's quite worrying. And the sort of concerns that students tell us are when we look at the practice and when students look at our practice, students tell us that they lack authenticity and relevance to real world tasks, that the things that we get them to do, the essays and the multiple choice questions and the, the time driven exams that we get them to do bear no resemblance to what they need, whether it's in their first job or their sixth job, they don't bear relevance. They're narrow in scope and have little long term benefit Often students are cramming the night before the exam, as we all know far too well. But they also tell us that we don't reward the effort that students put in. We only reward the grade, their final amount of learning. They tell us that they have unclear expectations. We have unclear expectations and we don't make the assessment criteria clear. We fail to provide adequate feedback 
And if students are telling us this, there is a problem that the assessments we set rely heavily on factual recall. Just think about that. If our students are telling us that, there's a problem. There's really a problem. Now, we know that enhancing assessment is fundamental to all of the excellence agendas that we talk about because it's such a major driver. But many academics, as with teaching, str struggle to change their practice. They need support, whether that's in diversifying their methods or understanding more about formative as opposed to summative assessment, formative being the developmental feedback that we give, whether it's about developing assessments that have more choice to be more inclusive or more transparency, using rubrics, whatever it is, whether it's about designing out plagiarism and designing in academ academic integrity, whatever it is, we know that our staff need help. And it's more than the staff. In addition, and I was delighted by the beginning of the session this morning, talking about your political contexts and the, the fact that we're not just talking about individual staff members changing skills, knowledge and attitudes, but institutional policies too. I know there's always a tension when it becomes political and we talk about measurement and academics are often running for the hills when this sort of thing is introduced, but it's so important. Now, I'd like to just talk briefly about some examples of the way that we introduce these things, but I'd like to share with you um, a comment that was made to me a week ago in a leading London university. It wasn't Cambridge, but it echoes a comment that we heard about Cambridge earlier. And he said to me, you mean that to teach, I need to know about my discipline and pedagogy? Really? I mean, this was last week. It wasn't 25 years ago that he said this. And then he shared with me at the end of the session he said, I feel like a dinosaur. I changed my lectures and the way I lecture because the research has become more complex. And he was explaining to me how he did that. And it was very good. But he said, over the last five years, and I've paraphrased here, the students are different too. And he said, they don't respond to my teaching and they don't want to come to my lectures. I know I need to do things differently, but I don't know how. And that's a situation that I've come across again and again and again. And one of the things that goes wrong is that as academics, our traditional route for development has been going to conferences. And we're quite good at picking conferences, particularly if they're disciplinary. But we make poor choices in how we can support our teaching and we often have very limited options. And so what you're doing here in the Ukraine is so terribly important. And we know that whatever we do has to emphasize this teaching excellence. But it has to be cost effective and it has to be results driven. Otherwise, you'll all be engaging in things that are terribly exciting and fun, but you won't know whether you're making a difference or not. And so the sorts of themes that we have uh, when we're developing programs may involve the kind of innovative pedagogies. Now, a lot of these might suggest a basis of technology, and that's fine if you've got it, but if you haven't got it, it doesn't matter. There's loads of things that we can do. Now, obviously, there's the stuff about assessment, but there's also the idea of how do we design programs. I really believe that what we do as academics with our program and curriculum design is highly sophisticated. And sadly, it's sometimes quite junior members of staff that are responsible for this. We need to be sure that we understand about aligning the learning outcomes with the teaching assessment. We need to understand what we're doing in terms of the levels that we're teaching and assessing at. 
but also leadership is a part of these programs. Now, individual universities and those responsible for provision across universities need to think very carefully about what we're doing. Who is it for? Who are we targeting? Are we targeting these um, experienced principals? And are we helping them get some more experience? I nearly fell off the stage there. Are we giving them more opportunity? We do have in the UK networks for very senior and experienced uh, leaders. But also we might be thinking in terms of provision for early career academics or experienced staff. Some of our provision will suit all of those, but sometimes it's targeted. Maybe it's online, maybe it's blended, face-to-face. -face. How are you going to do it? Is it going to be in blocks? Are people going to take a whole week off? Is it going to be at the evenings, weekends? Is it going to be online? However it's going to be, what's going to happen? Is it going to be structured or is it going to be according to demand? And who is going to deliver it? Are you going to use your own staff who have pockets of excellence to disseminate that practice? Or are you going to bring people in? It's very difficult to be a prophet in your own land, as the saying goes. But it's very important also that people speak your language, and I mean that in a broader sense, not just the, the language language, but people understand your local context. And sometimes you have to have a combination of both. This is how we do it here. Now, for a while, I was an external examiner for the Australian National University in Canberra. And they had a very interesting plan where they had what they called DECA modules, so tiny little chunks uh, which could be over a couple of hours or an afternoon and then people would drop in to them and they were run several times so that they would be able to uh, take what they needed and they had some optional ones and some universities don't do the 10 and 2, some would do six core modules and six optional modules or some that people put together for themselves based on things. And one of the colleagues from ANU just reminded us here that initially he was focused on being a better teacher, but then realised it was about designing better learning experiences. And he's, oops, he said here, um, oh, I'm sorry, I've just lost my slides. Well, that was exciting. Anyway, the gist of it was that he was saying that it took him quite a long time to understand that he had to get to the stage that it wasn't about his individual charismatic performance in the classroom. Now, I was going to talk to you about Northampton, but the key about Northampton in the UK is that they just have some ad hoc sessions which are based on things that people might be doing that colleagues would need to know about, learner, analytics, and so on. I'm just going to take a couple more minutes, Ian. Is that all right? Thank you. So it might be learner analytics or various things. that There's a little pocket of knowledge that would be shared with colleagues. And the sorts of programs that we put together, bespoke, so depending on what universities need, usually have combinations of what I've already spoken. So if we deliver a block, then module one would go down the first column, two and three separately. And one of the things that I particularly include is action research. I get people not just to try out new techniques, but to evaluate the effectiveness of them. And that's absolutely critical. And I'd like to show you some of the work that I do. These are from the Middle East. So classrooms are quite active. There's lots of visual representations going on on pages. And these were actually doing a, a Kahoot quiz. But also I use technology where it's available. But it doesn't have to be technology. I, you know, you can do that on a flip chart. You don't have to be creating a word cloud via people's mobile phones. They're engaging in a quiz, but it doesn't have to be online. 
These are doing, uh, putting things on an app called Padlet as opposed to PowerPoint. Some of you are nodding, you may use it already, but it doesn't have to be the case. And I found that when I looked at what they were getting out of it a few years ago, it was about confidence in knowing things, but widening a repertoire and then pedagogic change and learning to evaluate their practice through a range of different things. Now, I'd like to do two things. I'd like to tell you about a colleague who used to, he was a very experienced professor and a vice rector, and his students didn't like his teaching. He was teaching uh, the life of the holy prophet in Islamic studies, and they were bored because he was using a very, very traditional method that the prophet had used, and they were bored. And he understood that the reason they were bored was because they didn't understand what was going on and they, didn't, they couldn't find their own voice and they couldn't participate in the dialogues. And he changed the whole course. And he changed the methods, he changed the curriculum, and he began to make various modules that were about the life of the prophet and the prophet as the father and the husband and da-da-da. And he got um, massive improvements in his students' teaching, uh, their attainment, and the satisfaction was so off the scale that they gave him Teacher of the Year award, which was delightful. Now, the eagle eyes amongst you will spot me. I'm the only one not wearing a niqab. Uh, but we do have to, you know, fit things to the local context. And these ladies are all standing in front of their action research projects. And the sorts of things they looked at were the effective use of micro-learning, where they broke lecture content down and delivered it via WhatsApp, which is very heavily used in the Middle East. Gaming, virtual classrooms, virtual labs, and then more quizzes, blackboard, open book exams they'd never done before, never been allowed to do before because there was a compulsory multiple choice exam, and communities of practice. The point that I'd like to close on here is that it's really important from the beginning that you know what you're trying to achieve. And so when I go back to Simon Lancaster, who was talking about, are we using the same dated methods? He realized that there was a problem with his teaching because his students all answered questions in a very surface way. And so they weren't able to link information. They asked surface level questions and they gave surface level answers. He then did a lot of stuff with technology and peer learning and voting and all sorts of things. But at the end, he was able to check that he'd made a difference. So he then knew that his students' questions were much deeper and he could tell that they were linking concepts and engaging at a much deeper level with material. And then, of course, obviously, he wasn't surprised that their attainment increased. So I know that some of you will have questions around how do we know this works. And I will say to you that if you don't know what you're trying to achieve from the beginning and you're just having some new games, and as academics, we love that new kind of, oh, look, there's a new app, let's play with that. What are we trying to achieve is really important. I'm going to hand back to Ian, who's going to summarise, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to skip one slide and just summarise very briefly here. Um, Julie's talked about some of our international work. Um, does this, th does this make a difference? I talked about this at the start, and Julie's talked about the impact on people, and that's really the key. The impact on staff, and the, importantly, the impact on students. That's the real key of this. When we did a short teaching session in Kazakhstan, we found that 94% of participants were, were going to change their teaching practices following that. So it can make an immediate difference doing some of this work. But what I want to highlight here is a university in Thailand uh, that I've been working with called Walailak, right in the south of Thailand. Um, we've delivered three cohorts of a, a comprehensive teaching program, one that Julie showed in one of her slides, the three block one. And my contact there, the vice rector, said that when he started three years ago, there were no conversations about learning and teaching at the university. 
it was not what was discussed. He said there is now a culture of learning and teaching at the university. And in, in his own words, he said there is now a language of learning and teaching. People actually discuss this at breaks. Um, and following that, they've now got, um, I think, the highest number of uh, fellows in Thailand. Um, and they also found that student retention at the university, this is only in a, a two-year period, has improved by 30%. This isn't just because of the work we've done, this is largely because of the work they've done as well. So what I've got a picture of here is me with their president actually launching what they call their UKPSF club. It's a little club they use for teachers to discuss their teaching work and discuss things that they've done and how it's going. So hopefully that's told you a bit about the UK experience and what we do and how those have been applied in different parts of the world and we'd love to take some questions from you. Hello? Yeah. Okay, Ian, thank you, thank you very much for um, a really interesting and inspiring uh, uh, dual presentation, double presentation. We have got some questions on Slido, and I can see some hands already up, but I'll start with a question from me, because I've got the mic, so I've got the power, uh, which is being un very unfair of me. But um, you, you talked about how universities in the UK um, are approaching this issue and developing stuff. How do you, I mean, what scope is there for universities in the UK to uh, share those approaches with each other, to jointly develop responses, you know, or are they all independently and separately? And I'm sure the answer is no. How, how, do you, how can universities collaborate um, to um, improve teaching and learning? Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, we'll probably both chip in on this, but. Um, Absolutely, there is collaboration, and I think Julie touched upon, um, we run as an organisation a network for pro-vice-chancellors and deputy vice-chancellors, so these are equivalent of vice-rectors, um, for those senior level staff to share best practice, but we also um, coordinate networks of other groups of staff as well, um, as an organisation, so an advanced HG network for accredited programme leaders, for example. But frankly, there are plenty that emerge organically as well. So, um, you know, if you go around the UK, you'll hear about the M25 group. For those that don't know the UK, there's, there's a road around London that's the M25, and there's the staff that work in those universities get together on a regular basis and talk about things like this, what works, compare approaches. So there are both kind of national-led things which we, we take part in and, and lead on, and there's also things that come up organically as well. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And there's, there's also a lot of online sharing of work. But importantly, one of the quality measures that our universities are assessed on is not that we just meet the quality assurance standards, but part of our quality enhancement is that good practice and best practice is A, identified, and B, shared and disseminated. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take one from Slido before we come to the floor. So um, this is this is a challenging question, uh, but it's but it relates to how you ended, Julie. How do you define the vis vision for teaching excellence institutionally? I.e., how do you define the point of destination you want to reach? I'll kick off. Um, definitions will vary. It's a very good question. So much depends on a university's mission and values. We are beginning to get some differenti differentiation in universities. Some are brave enough to focus more on the teaching supported by research, and others are research and teaching, uh, research-led. So it does depend on the vision but usually, and it was a requirement from the last 20 years for universities to have a learning and teaching strategy 
and increasingly that's now measured with, with very clear KPIs. So if we're talking about student graduate skills in, in technology or graduate skills in critical thinking or assimilating of evidence, pricey, summarise, whatever it is, then you'll see that appearing in the strategies and that will then guide the methods that we choose. And of course the disciplinary stuff is also important. Totally. I, I don't think I could agree more or add a lot more to it. I mean, it's, I think it's similar a bit to the discussion earlier that Mikhailo commented on in terms of the different natures of different universities. And we see that in the UK. I mean, we've, uh, both within the UK and outside, we've recently done a teaching programme with a brand new um, drama university in the Middle East. And the person we found to lead on that was someone who was a disciplinary expert because teaching drama is very, at higher education levels very different to teaching medicine, for example. Um, and therefore, it flows down from the university strategy, what they're wanting to achieve, um, into how that affects their teaching, what they expect from that. Thank you. Um, we'll take some questions from the floor. So there, there were some hands up before. I think you're the first. So if I can ask a colleague, our centre, bring the microphone to you. Uh, good afternoon good to speakers and to the audience. Uh, Irina Shkura, Vice Rector for Quality Assurance of Education, Alfred Nobel University, Dnipro. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to the speakers and the moderator uh, for a very inspirative and good presentation. The, my, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is the following. Um, could you give us uh, some general information in what way United Kingdom universities uh, motivate their staff to participate in such uh, practices, in such schools or development programs? And the second one, um, do United Kingdom universities uh, develop professionalism, not teaching staff, but some supportive staff? Okay, thank you. Yes. I'll start and then hand over to you. So. Um is the phrase the carrot and the stick, it, does that translate into Ukrainian? Um, donkey. So the, the idea in the UK is we have a, it's for, for donkeys, you have a carrot to tempt them in a direction and then use a stick if it's not going in the right direction. So there's the kind of motivation, encouragement and the forcing, push, push, push and pull. Um, and there's both methods used in the UK. So I mentioned it isn't mandatory to, to do teaching development in the UK, but most universities ask people to do a qualification within the first two years, otherwise you'll lose your job. So that's one way of motivating people. But not all universities do that, and there are other ways, effectively, in sharing best practice that they do. That they, we have, you know, we run a teaching and learning conference annually where people actually share what they're doing, and there's a lot more of a, an encouraging um, approach to this. You know, there are some universities, for example, that have their own journals of. Um, teaching research, but it's not, not in terms of um, high level education research, but, but just work that colleagues are doing, sharing that with others around the university, to again kind of bring that, build that culture of learning and teaching. Um, and there's other things in terms of, it can be built into reward criteria, so you can become a professor now for your, for your work on teaching. Um, to answer the second question, um, and I'll let Julie then come in, um, the answer is absolutely yes, all members of staff are allowed. So I'm actually an associate fellow, um, which is one of the qualifications of teaching. I've never taught anybody, you may have guessed. Um, I'm, uh, it's because of my work in learning technology and learning support. So staff who are learning technologists, lab technicians, librarians, those who help learners are very much part of the learning experience as much as regular lecturers or professors. And they are highly encouraged. Some universities encourage them more than others, but many universities very much focus on those staff because they have a huge impact on the teaching experience and the learning experience. So they're very much part of, part of the work that's done. And we do know that students uh, have a higher level of satisfaction in universities where there is a really integrated approach so between the professional services and the academic staff. I would go a step further, I agree with everything Ian said, but I would go one step further and say that we are moving in many universities now to requiring students to engage. So this condition of probation, you lose your job, that's a fairly firm one. Uh, but also, many universities now, you won't be able to gain promotion in academic terms 
unless you have either a qualification or you are a fellow or senior fellow, principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy. So it's moving, it's shifting. It's always better to move intrinsically rather than extrinsically. The one thing that you don't see in the UK, but I've seen in many universities internationally, particularly when those universities are new to the agenda of transformation and teaching excellence, is money. We don't, we don't mess around with people's salaries and we don't give bonuses uh, at all uh, in relation to attainment. Occasionally universities reserve the right to give a bonus for a particularly innovative something or other, but money's not usually used. Thank you. Um, and I should say, we, we three forgot to bring our microphone, our, our earphones with us. But if anyone, if anyone does yeah. want to ask a question not in English, please do. Yeah. Um, and we, we will. Any questions from the floor? Yeah, this one there. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ignatenko from Kharkiv University, named after Karazin. And... Uh, the question is the following. It's the University of Law in Kharkiv. The question is about the British experience of engaging to the university's representatives of business stakeholders to, uh, to, uh, to, include, to, to, to teach the students. What are the conditions in which the British universities are engaging the business people or the uh, uh, representatives of various sectors of the economy into the teaching process. Usually in Ukraine, we are hiring them at uh, the lowest position. We pay them very modest, very small salary, and we expect them to uh, adhere by all the requirements to the professors so that they develop the curricula and things like that. And they usually leave after one semester because it's too much work for them. And uh, workload is high. Whether we have to consider them uh, professors, teachers, uh, or maybe we can use other forms of engagement of these people because it's really necessary to do. And we can see that it's very effective uh, and the results of their participation is very good, uh, are very good. Whether we have to um, have this set of requirements to them, which will be similar to the uh, professors and teachers of the university who work full time in the university. What, what is the approach to this issue in Great Britain? Thank you. Good question. <laughs> Do you want me to go? Um, this is a very key issue in the UK. Um, we refer to it as employability is the, is the key theme. Um, and there's a few ways to answer this, really. One thing I would say is that it's student expectation has driven the need for universities to make their programs relevant. So the students... Um, are very, in the UK, are very, very focused on their graduate destination. Um, so wh what job they will get. And so therefore, they really, really want uh, universities to ensure that their programs are going to prepare them for their, for their work, whether that's their first job or their sixth job. Um, and, and, that, and actually on that, you know, the World Economic Forum, some of their recent research showed that the skills that employers want going to the future are actually around more about things like critical thinking, problem solving, communication skills. Um, so universities are expected now to ensure that not only are those skills developed, um, both working with employers, but also in a lot of cases to make it very clear what's happening. So in some cases, universities were doing this. They were asking students to do projects, but they were not saying you know, this history project, you're working with others, this is teamwork, you know, this is something you're going to be able to use. And the university I used to work at in the UK had its own award, actually, for, um, to measure, kind of, uh, the student engagement with different, um, kind of, for the workplace, to actually prepare them for the work, to assess them against things like those sorts of skills, and to talk about their, um, talk about their work experience, but also about their university experience and how it prepared them for it. So, it's a long way to say that it's a really important issue for the UK and it's one that is growingly driven by student and employer needs. And in fact, in my bag, I'll, I'll 
I'll show you a copy later. We have a framework for employability that we publish which shows people how they can build that into their curriculum, into the student experience, which is it's freely available on our website. Um, Thanks, Ian. In relation to the, the part of the question that was about how we use the staff in this regard, we do a variety of things. Sometimes we do much the same as you've described, but more commonly we may pay them an honorarium, a, a payment, a one-off payment, which can be slightly fluid in terms of what they do. Maybe we pay them by the hour for a guest lecture, but sometimes more than that. But more commonly, we try to involve them in a range of different levels. So a program would have a board that would meet each once a year, twice a year, and we would consult a number of employers, business people, whoever. Or maybe they would take a role in mentoring some of our students. Or maybe we would sit down in a regular meeting and talk about changes to the curriculum. Or if they, are, if they have employed some of our students, then what were the weaknesses and the strengths that they noticed in our graduates? So some of that we have, I'm assuming you have a similar concept of corporate social responsibility. So um, the idea there is that businesses are happy to give a portion of their time to the process that goes on in universities without payment, but often we would give them things that they might like. They might want a certificate or a badge on their wall, or they might want a library card to use our, our precious library resources or an online, you know, we can do it in different ways. We, the difficulty we have is if we want to employ them, if they've been successful in their business, sometimes the salaries don't match what they would like. And so we do have to be quite inventive to find ways that would work best for them. But one of the closing things I would say is that many academics in the UK in some discipline areas practice duly in their own profession as well as teaching but often they tell us that the students don't recognize them as a real architect artist whatever it is because they see them doing the teaching and they think that they must be out of date and there's a real problem there uh, it's it's perception i'm not sure if that answers your question does that answer you Thank you. Um, we have, we've, got one, we've got one from um, Slido, and then we'll take one quickly from the floor. Um, and it's, um, it, it's a question I think I can answer myself, but I, but I will ask a question from it, which is, um, it is um, commenting on the role of financial support for teaching excellence. And the question is, is teaching excellence possible without investments from government and university? I, I guess we'd all say the answer is no, it's not. And yes, you do need investment, of course. But I would say, how do, I mean, you know, in the, the UK system, how, you know, to what extent, how, you know, do universities recognise the need to invest um, in this process and, and, and what are the different ways that they do that? Briefly. Briefly, yeah. uh, yes, it is very important and I think it's, it's, you can't run a programme of any kind, whether that's your history programme or a teaching development programme without some resource to do it. Um, so you have to consider your constraints. Some universities are lucky in order they're able to invest um, a lot of money in long programs, comprehensive ones. Others maybe don't have that investment, so they perhaps send people on open programs or work in collaboration with other institutions. So there are, or they run perhaps shorter programs, very, you know, lunchtime developmental and sharing sessions. So people, to use a phrase, cut their cloth. They, they sometimes, you know, resource constraints are important, and if people, if you do want to do a teaching development program, then you have to realise that, that, that some investment is needed to, to do so. And perhaps the biggest investment is staff time, because you can spend a lot of money on designing a program, or you can do a good program without spending any money, but if you can't free your staff up to get them there, and you don't give them the time to reflect on their practice or consult a mentor or do peer review of teaching all of this takes time and if that isn't built in to whatever workload management system you do or don't use or whatever arrangements you have in your departments it's very hard and 
I think partly because of the teaching excellence framework, which has really made this public in the UK. Gone are the days where people can get away without being able to give their staff time to, for development. It's very, it's recognised, and if you're not engaging in something, then the assumption is that, you know, you're either going forwards or you're going back, but you're not standing still. Thank you. So a message to some of the rectors and senior managers in the audience. I think we have, we have just time before lunch for one question for the colleague here. Uh, hello. Uh, National Economic University, Oleg Lutsushin, Institute of Creative Studies Director. Is there a practice of using a synergy of formal and informal education in Britain. If it's there, is it applied often? And what are the methods of recognizing informal education in the formal education system in the UK? That's the first question. And the second, involving uh, practicing professionals, how do you do it? Do they deliver trainings? That's very useful for our students and all over the world, obviously, especially if it's practically oriented studies. So how are these two components combined in British education and how can we implement that in our experience? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Um, yes, is the answer. Uh, from students' perspective, from students' experience, they will have opportunities on some degrees in most universities for them to be able to do a community-based project or something that would interest them. Some universities will be able to find some small start-up funding if somebody had an idea that they wanted to generate and it would need some, sm I'm talking small pockets of money, not thousands or anything. And they would sometimes be able to use that towards perhaps they'd write a reflective essay on it or something and they would actually get academic credit for that as well. So other universities wouldn't give academic credit for it but they'd give the space. Others would not give them academic credit or space but they'll let them go and do an internship in the summer that they have to fund themselves. But there's a recognition that this is increasingly important to them. And in terms of informal learning for staff, then there is huge recognition within the fellowship scheme but also in university schemes that one's ability to reflect on one's own critical uh, experiences as much as anything else that we might do in terms of going here, there or talking to people or working in a team or having discussions at lunchtime are all very important. And universities also do put together semi-structured programs which sometimes might include things like role play or drama people coming in to enact inclusion and diversity or disability issues or whatever is that what you yeah. were thinking can about? i can i add one tiny thing just to the first part uh, if you're interested in this area um the there's a lot of work in Australia at the moment about something called micro-credentialing, they call it, which is effectively bite-sized learning. What they're seeing is you can go online now and do an online course, you know, on Coursera or FutureLearn to learn all sorts of bits of learning, and that's just as valid, yeah. you know, these MOOCs, massive open online courses. So a lot of Australian universities particularly are looking at how you can recognise some of that as part of a formal structure or whether you need to. And there's, there's a really good paper I could share with you about that and about whether there are cases when sometimes learning doesn't need to be formally recognized or accredited. It's just, you know, to help you get better. And there's other times when it really does help to have that qualification side. And there's some really interesting work going on on that, particularly in Australia. The thing that students need, though, is some sort of proof that they've done things. And so we are increasingly using more than the transcript of the marks when students graduate. So encouraging them to either build a portfolio or have some sort of list of things that the students have done and achieved and engaged with that would be presented to an employer and form a basis for discussion alongside the grades. Thank you very much. I've been avoiding looking at Luda because I, I knew we'd run out of time. But um, we have run out of time now. Thank you very much to Ian and Julie for this session. They will be around over lunch, I know, to, um, uh, uh, to, to take questions and for the rest of today. Um, so we now break for lunch and we come back here at 1.30.
So have, enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Really great questions. And, great, and great. real quick. Normally, normally I'm the only non teacher in the room at the British Council events. So it's, <laughs> it's nice to know. It's not just.
всі готові продовжувати, я сподіваюся, всі поїли, всі ще. Well, I hope we are ready to start and thank you very much for your attention. And now I can see that everybody stayed with us. So I believe that uh, you stay because you would like to know more about the program. Now I would like to introduce a research which we have carried out this summer. And uh, this is the needs assessment uh, in terms of the needs uh, of the uh, teaching and uh, learning in the in the higher educational system. And we did that to find out where we should emphasize things so that we would understand what is the status of the teaching excellency in the universities. And this, uh, the results of this research or uh, study has to give us information about the program, a future program, and the way of its implementation. So I would like to introduce to you the results of this uh, research or survey. We, together with our partners uh, and uh, with the trainers, with the experts in the higher education area, have developed a questionnaire, a which a polling, which which included a lot of uh, questions which related to the practice of teaching professional development in the universities. And 209 individuals have participated in this survey from 45 universities. It's quite an impressive sample, and we would like to thank everybody who participated in this uh, uh, polling. And uh, we actually visited a couple of universities, and we carried out in-depth interviews, focus groups with the academic personnel, teaching personnel, the students, and the Ministry of Education as well, and those experts who are working in this area in Ukraine at present. And here you can see a photograph, and this is the way we were conducting the focus group together with the students, because teaching uh, uh, is connected with the students and their opinion is very important. I would like to uh, screen a video. It is not going to demonstrate the results uh, which we have obtained, but we actually asked a couple of questions to the teachers, professors, the students, and they were happy to answer those questions. And the answers will uh, help us to understand what were the results or findings of this survey. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you understand under the quality education? Uh, this is Hanna Kharlamova, Kiev State University, named after Shevchenko. Unfortunately, we have no sound. So the apologies for the technical uh, difficulties. Now we would like to try to uh, turn on the sound. The product which is offered by the teacher to the student. And what is, in your understanding, the quality teaching? First of all, it's synergy. Synergy of the charisma of the teacher, knowledge, experience, the, the ability to uh, use the methods of teaching appropriately, uh, to sustain the attention of the audience. And uh, this is a unique uh, amalgamation of uh, the self-evaluation and the evaluation of the product which your teacher offers the students and also the feedback from the student. If all these uh, pieces of puzzle come together, then as a result, uh, we will get uh, the quality education. A good teacher is not afraid of answering the questions and the teacher asks the questions uh, to the students. And that's great when you continue thinking about the answers to these questions, even out of school, when you are, you know, um, spending spending time in the evening and what scenario could be offered. And uh, also the teacher is not afraid to acknowledge that he or she is not does not know the answer to the questions uh, uh, of the students, but they always promise to find these answers. To learn how to work with the scope of information which we are working with, to evaluate, to analyze, to critically think and to analyze the results. The most important uh, for the teacher is to have knowledge, professionalism, and also the 
the wish to tell us new things. And these should not be just the lectures which never change, but these are very practical knowledge which is transferred to us and we will be able to use it in our life. And the difficulties, the difficulties which arise in my work, well, uh, are the old facilities because to train the specialists, it is necessary to uh, have good, modern, up-to-date equipment in the laboratories which, up, uh, which comply with the educational standards, uh, international standards, uh, to teach on high quality level so that the material is properly uh, perceived by the audience. I need j just the environment, uh, appropriate teaching environment, uh, but at sometimes I cannot get an appropriate uh, classroom and they cannot uh, use the method which I would like to pilot. And uh, well, at the beginning of my teacher's career, I've confronted a lot of difficulties. I do not have specialized pedagogical education. After I graduated the university, I started to teach immediately. And then, then I lacked the pedagogical skills. And it is very important for the postgraduates uh, to get some education in pedagogics. And it is necessary to introduce into the universities. What support do you need to develop your teaching skills? Well, I, uh, we have to go through internships to improve the technology of development of pedagogical skills and working on the uh, abilities of a good speaker and also the actors skills, also attend the uh, teachers co-working and using the electronic uh, means of education. Motivation is very important. Uh, that is remuneration for using the new methods of teaching and also the personal motivation, personal growth when uh, the uh, person is happy with the uh, self-development results. Also, we need more trainings. We need more institutional capacity uh, to provide uh, the uh, training to the teachers and uh, we we do not have a sufficient space for communication and the well we need to carry out more meetings uh, between the specialists uh, and uh, definitely it is necessary to have the sources where um, an, ed uh, an educator can read a lot of information about the work of uh, their peers and also share the experience maybe share some pedagogical secrets and tricks they're using and we are lacking that at all uh, we also we have uh, certain skills as specialists in our area but we have to master the pedagogical skills and the skills of teaching. Do you agree to these answers? Do you agree to the answers the teachers and professors gave us to our questions? It's in a nutshell the results of our polling and the issues which were raised by our uh, interviewed. But I would like to tell you what uh, conclusions we have made after we have completed this polling. <coughs> Four more components were included in our survey and four emphasis we wanted to make. And we also were asking questions uh, in accordance with these components. Resources of teaching, methods of teaching and evaluation, and using of technologies in teaching and the ongoing professional development. As for the resources for teaching, it is interesting that the majority of the respondents, 72%, uh, said that they do have access to the um, uh, to classrooms w where they can teach their own discipline. But when we started to delve deeper and we started to ask more questions, it appeared that in reality they do not have access to absolutely everything they need and they lack mostly uh, 
IT, uh, ICT technologies. Uh, they said that the computer classrooms are not sufficient. There is uh, no multimedia um, media um, technologies. And 35% of the poll said that this is their urgent need. Then flexible um, educational environment. You've heard already that there is not always an opportunity to refurnish, rearrange the classroom so that they can uh, carry out group work, individual work, also access to online resources, various publications. This need exists as well, and also access to laboratories. And then we were discussing the uh, proactive methods of teaching and evaluation, and a lot of respondents, for example, the students, and you've heard about that, they said that the worst uh, thing is uh, just a lecture when uh, the lecturer is uh, providing the material from the textbooks which they can use on their own. And when we were asking our lecturers where they considered to be the best, they said that the best experience was when they were using the proactive methods of teaching. That is using the group work, individual work, uh, and uh, the work on projects, uh, you using uh, the simulations, demonstrations, everything which encourages the students uh, to to work more and to do something together, not just provide the material to the students, but make them look for this material themselves. And um, it was mentioned already that technologies are crucial in terms of improvement of teachers. 97% of the respondents said that they are using the various technologies during their uh, classes, and that's great. But again, we cannot believe uh, you know everything we hear so we started to ask additional questions and there are two major problems or issues what hampers uh, using the new technology first of all the lack of those of their off and that's the biggest need and the lack of skills uh, to use these technologies. The teachers quite often said that the students know ICTs better than the teachers do, and we feel lagging behind our students, and we really need to be taught and trained how to use it. We have to get information of which methods exist, how to use them, and it's not always necessary to have some very special equipment for this purpose, because at present all the students have smartphones, and they can use those smartphones du during the uh, lectures uh, and uh, the uh, professional development uh, and uh, this continuous professional development and we can discuss it endlessly and uh, a lot of comments were made to this effect during our polling. And the respondents say that there is no national system of recognition of teachers. There are no national awards to motivate the, student, the teachers, uh, to encourage them to uh, work uh, with advanced methods. And several people said that a career promotion, unfortunately, does not depend on teaching, but it depends only on research work. And you can see that the issues we, which we were discussing today are quite topical at present. And, and that's a great thing that at present in the universities, they are uh, opening the programs for professional development of the teachers and we visited these universities and today you're going to hear a little bit of their experience we have selected several universities a nas national university municipal university and private university so that you can see how it works in various universities and which patterns they're using and this is a, again another proof uh, of the fact that there is no cut the cookie approach to the, to arranging the system of professional development for the teachers and 76 percent of the respondents say that they participate in various trainings conferences seminars and that there are a lot of trainings which are offered to them and they are trying uh, to develop themselves participating in these events and they have access to education and research work outside ukraine within the 
the framework of the Erasmus Plus program and quite a large um, ratio of the teachers use this opportunity and continue using this opportunity. And the conclusions. The best practices of teaching exist, and we should not, you know, go somewhere abroad to, to tap on them. And we not only have to use the international experience in this area, they exist in Ukraine, but we have to find them and to disseminate them, as Julia said. And the dissemination of best practices needs to be improved. We need the national platform to disseminate this experience and best practices. And we hope that this conference is going to become such a platform to uh, disseminate the experience. This is the first conference, and we are going to carry out similar events annually and give an opportunity to share best practices. And we have to make a transition from we have to make a transition to student center uh, teaching. And uh, here we will use a lot of interactive methods of teaching, and it is necessary to develop the professional standards of the teacher of higher educational establishment. And uh, well, in Great Britain, these framework of professional standards exist. And at present, the ministry is working in Ukraine to develop such professional standards as well, which will be uh, introduced to, to us in the nearest future. Institutional infrastructure to improve the teaching uh, is necessary. This is necessary. Uh, this is to create the centers, developing the strategy strategies of teaching and learning excellencies. And this program, which we have developed, and you will see that, has several components. Unfortunately, we cannot impact certain issues which were raised during our survey. We cannot create flexible space, educational space in the university. And we uh, cannot provide technologies, uh, uh, hardware for the universities, but we can provide the teachers and the universities uh, with the ways to uh, to use the interactive methods of teaching and uh, to help them develop these competencies. And this will be a practical part of our program. This survey um, uh, is available. It's at the page of the British Council where you have registered to this forum. And uh, you will be able to enter this page and read the results of this survey. And we've mentioned already that we would like to familiarize you with the experience of three various universities which we visited during our uh, survey uh, work. But prior to uh, open the next session, we would like uh, to ask you one question. It's going to be a question online to find out something from you. So please enter the site of the slide. Yes. And the B BC 2019 is the password. And there is a question whether the professional development of the teachers is part of the strategy of your university. Please be honest. It's anonymous. It's absolutely anonymous. So you can tell us the truth, the way uh, the situation evolves at present uh, in reality. Whether there is an opportunity, uh, whether there is professional development is part of the strategy of your university. Whether the strategy of your university includes the issue of professional development, 50 50 years so far. Well, approximately the results are similar. That's why. I think that it means that we are moving in the correct direction, and the question we asked was very correctly formulated. Now I would like to introduce to you Ms. Elena Orgel, who is going to moderate the next session, and the universities where we have carried out our uh, polling are going to share their experience. Good afternoon. Now we open the next session, and uh, this is dedicated to the experience of Ukrainian universities in terms of professional development of the teachers. 
improvement of their skills. I think that this is an extremely and important part of our presentation because, as it was mentioned by Mr. Mikhail Vinitsky, we have things to share, even if we compare ourselves to Cambridge and Oxford. I recall when I was a child, my parents and my the friends of our parents, uh, well, the teachers were attending the um, in-service training courses to the capital of to Moscow, the capital now of the Soviet Union, and, there were, and uh, then it was uh, Leningrad and uh, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, and we have a tradition of paying attention to the professional development of the teachers. Julie explained why we are going to offer you the experience of three universities, because they participated in our survey, and they proved their capacity, ability uh, to uh, the professional development of the teachers uh, and the fact that they are that they they represent three sectors of our higher education national municipal and the, the private and before giving the floor to the speakers, to the uh, esteemed representatives of the universities, I would like to warn you that I am going to aggressively protect fairness and not to allow people to be discriminated so that each speaker will have his or her own 10 minutes and will give the opportunity to the audience to ask the questions. Mr. Bugrov, the vice director for scientific pedagogical work, of the Kiev National University named after Taras Shevchenko. A good afternoon, dear friends. First of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share that small experience that we have in our university. And before that, just several remarks. First of all, I wanted to say that as I'm a teacher of philosophy, that's my main profession, the problem of staff development is of mostly ideological nature. We still cannot understand why we need that. And uh, not infrequently having good practices and good opportunities, we still discuss why we actually need that. The second problem is that the abbreviation even on the state level, there is this domination of the first letter. To have uh, the, to become a dean or a professor, you need to have publications in databases, you need to have uh, research internships and all that, and that is a big challenge. And too bad that our colleagues, uh, including those from the Ministry of Educational Science, have left, because this has to be changed on the state level until the do there is this domination on the state level uh, we are going to only remain in our environment. So there should be some balance here. Also, I'm going to tell you now what's, what do we have. Well, in our internal university regulation, we uh, use such words as learning as continuous professional development that's uh, not an, uh, on workplace and the, or the basic platform for that would be the Institute of Postgraduate Education. It has CPD programs of different nature, but uh, also uh, having uh, it also proposes various study programs, actually very different. And I'm going to discover in the end, of course, internships. That is a traditional type. Why? Why uh, I was talking about this abbreviation because during my post, I'm signing those uh, internships uh, approvals. Uh, this is. I did some small but not really relevant research. 95% of internships go for uh, for uh, for research, and only 5% out of all of that, and we have about thousand of those, goes for pedagogical improvement. So we have experiences 2014. You see that there are programs, study programs that we did. Um, it's research um, and pedagogical staff and only pedagogical staff. We have about 200 heads of labs and methodologists who are in the category of uh, teaching staff. So that's why we had this program. 109 people headed deputy deans and deputy directors. So the, uh, the uh, biggest moving force, we also had that program. There were also those in preparatory department, just like everyone. We have more internationalization now about 
2,000 students, uh, international students, and starting from immigration issues and documents and up to ethnic and cultural issues, we deal with that because uh, very often these are people from the Middle East, and we have to deal with that. Um, for example, in the Institute of Biology and Medicine, there, is a, there are a lot of Iranian students. Uh, we, uh, we include a man in the commission every time because it is an obligatory requirement, because there are some ethnical and cultural peculiarities. Institute of Biology and Medicine has now people who have medical education but don't have pedagogical uh, competences. They had very hard but obligatory course for them. Then financial and legal college asked us to do that. We did that and did the most complicated because the current also of um, study programs from this year we have the honor to pass over 60 accreditations. And just as most of you, out of 60 accreditations, 54 are accreditations of the third level. As a rule, the grantors of study programs on the third level are professors, academicians, and telling them about uh, program studies, program results, what Mr. Gojek does. I'm thankful to him uh, because this is the most complicated, probably. And when academician says, do I have to teach them research and do research in a program, the uh, no learning results. I mean, that's a challenge that we jointly uh, have to answer to. Then, uh, I believe that we uh, have the rather interesting case. Member of student parliament also went to a training on student participation, forming study programs, uh, and the, uh, some experts became the experts of National Quality Assurance Agency. That's a great case, I believe. Then remember, there was a question to our UK colleagues. Is it only for teachers? No. Uh, we actually, you see, you see the number in the end? These are employees of chairs and labs. Last winter, when we had the chance for all of them and for their understanding, we explained that what the Bologna process was and up to how they work with the students. Psychology, communication, all that. So the research staff, those who do the organization, and the most important and interesting case, you see the last one. That's what was mentioned about the spaces and all that. But that's talking to those who does daily administrative managerial activities. Because when a, a teacher comes to the head of course to help to implement the main mission of the university, students and high quality training so that it is on an adequate level. I'm not going to say that I'm convinced that we have achieved these grandiose results, but at least some steps were made. You see here, uh, because when we understood the importance of this process, that's the peak. Uh, in 2018, we had uh, classes for 727 persons. All that was at the expense of the universities, I have to say. So this is what we believed to be our obligation. What are the types of work? I mean, this rather traditional, everything that we have been doing in our university of uh, postgraduate education. It, it was great for me to see this last name because uh, it wasn't me who was preparing this presentation, but we, un we do not restrict ourselves to those who work in our university. For example, when we did courses for the graduates of educational programs, and there were several cycles of trainings for the deans. Ivan Primachenko told, talked about online education. Probably, you know, he is one of the founders of Prometheus platform. He is also the graduate and postgraduate department in history. And uh, Taras Tymoshko was the one telling about academic integrity. I think you, I think you know him because he's one of the curators of academic integrity project. Now we invited to. to uh, Andriy Sidlerenko to tell about anti-plagiarism uh, programs. I think everybody also knows him. So we involve, as you can see, there is this position one before last. This is head of HR. 
this is one of the biggest problems. I had the chance last week to to spend in Northumbria University in Newcastle within the British Co uh, uh, Council project, Creative Spark. I'm very thankful to the British Council because that is a fascinating project. But there, there was uh, another interesting thing there that their HR department is responsible for that. We still have this institutional problem that HR departments have still remained on the same level that they were. So that's why HR director, he's a rather progressive person there. We involve him all the time with a bilateral goal so that he told the people about all these processes, administrative and other stuff, and so that he actually heard. And uh, it is from those uh, who work with them. So uh, to tell, say to say that we have spectacular results, no, but we still have some going forward. What do we use uh, all the time? For example, when there were representatives of biology and medicine institutions, each of them had to write a study program as or compile a curriculum because they are practitioners. For them, uh, it was a creative task, and. Uh, the head of uh, education quality checked all of those, and not all of them, I'll tell you, not all of them managed to pass. So they didn't get the certificate. So we do surveying, and you see, for me, it was actually in interesting to find out that almost 98% want these types of work, to have these types of work for their own. So this is the criteria we put in. Now it's just going to do it very quickly. Yes, this is what we have our proposals. So what are we already doing when doing certification of uh, pedagogical stuff, for example, uh, some success in that, and even when uh, they all submit for annual bonuses, for example, you pass or you don't pass, and it this graduate works you also you look at some career development there but now we are working so that uh, these proposals are implemented and so that we could actually put a lot of online resources and in this way we could do this accessible for the use all the time so again I would like to thank for the initiative of this great project and I'm totally convinced that without uh, this situation, we just we just won't be able to achieve that. Otherwise, thank you. Uh, thank you, Volodymyr. You kept to the time really well. Thanks for that. Uh, Natalia Vinnikova, Vice Rector on Research Work, Kiev University. Kiev Borisgrinchenko University. A good afternoon, colleagues. I'm very thankful to the organizers for inviting me and for the opportunity to share our case, which is the case of Kiev Borisgrinchenko University. And we're deeply convinced that the develop that staff development and retraining, all this should be in the philosophy and the corporate culture of each university. In our corporate culture, it is something declared, but each of you is going to say, wait, declarations must remain declarations. I would totally agree with you here. But we also declare that we have to facilitate each teacher in their personal professional development. So that's why we're working on that. And as for the following slide, you know these documents very well. We have to keep to those because this is Ukrainian legislation. But the last document, you are going to see that this is of 2015, and it is starting from that year. We started implementing the case that I'm going to talk about. We already uh, has, we see that many years have passed, and I have to say that this case is mobile, and we work all the time to improve this system for HR development in our university. The biggest problem is, of course, uh, going out of comfort zone. Each of us, because each of us is a teacher, somebody is more mobile, somebody is more ready 
for self-development and our task as the management is to do so that somebody who are not really open for the process become more open and start self-developing the thing you know this upper uh, uh, line because it's from the regulations that this is taken into account during the competition selection but in our university we're really trying to do that not only because it's written like that it is because really this self-development this it, it influences this uh, uh, quality in our university we have a ranking of professional achievements which is called leader of the year and in this ranking there are different indicators and sections you can open it and see on our website if you find something useful we'll be happy if you also use that but a separate aspect is that we take into account a certain amount of points no matter what we say we still have to measure it somehow and take that we are looking for this quality and quantity parameters indicators we're working on all that all together and we taking uh, this is certain number of points for this retraining internship in this ranking so according to the results of this annual rankings we have some opportunities for prizes and all that according to the decision of university management according to the objective parameters all data are put into are put into the system by this stuff as for the features of our system and of our case in our retraining system there are two blocks there is an obligatory part which develops in our opinion the key competences of a a university teacher, a professional one, which would be internships and everything about improvement and development of me as a linguist, as a, a physicist, as a uh, chemist. So the didactic competence, research competence, leadership, and digital competence. And according to that, this has been developed in the university as modules. We decided for ourselves that a minimal number of hours, at least 30, for such obligatory components and for each model year after year we still have trainers or there are other trainings arriving depending on uh, so this system is flexible but the fact that we are keeping to these five modules so to say uh, which is professional didactic leadership and digital and also the module which develops uh, digital competences this remains the second part for retraining would be the variable part. The teacher can choose modules which are inside the university and are developed now. Um, very briefly, I'm going to describe that or beyond the university. For example, for the development of foreign language competence, legal competence, project management competence, and so on. All these things, this is retraining, this is, this is development that can be done both in, in Ukraine and beyond. We do not limit them. We have agreements with other universities in other countries. We have mobility programs. So there is an international education strategy that is developing here. This is our mission. I also have to say not to forget because I also have just 10 minutes that HR development has a written out priority in our strategy for university development, which was approved between 2018 and 2022 you can find it on the website it is true this totally works and you can look at the strategy so how does this training go how does the internship go we we'll single out this specialized professional module most of you understands why this is happening so first when we started implementing this case and this system of obligatory and variation models we are planning that we are going to approve the plan for all five obligatory modules but then practice has shown that when it, this system started working and teachers starting for themselves not to choose the ones every five years or the research module or something developing digital competence we propose several of them by content that is why we don't have the need anymore to actually plan these four obligatory modules because most teachers already themselves are drawing their trajectory of development 
and which really makes us happy and this module actually we're going according to the plan because this what the chair is the institute the departments and to understand the system because this actually going beyond so you have already read the scheme on the slide i'm not going to repeat myself how is the training organized by four obligatory modules on the website there is an announcement with the content of this module there is a registration form and then also the maximal number for each month because this is a training form you cannot have too many people and we announce this registration and as soon as we have sufficient number of participants we complete the registration and we open the um, lessons and if we understand that there is a need and we do know about the needs because we communicate in the university then we can again announce the same program if there is a uh, if there are requests for it or something else we are ready to propose but within these four modules which are compulsory and the content of the modules is is changing it's mobile we are trying to respond to the challenges respond to the needs and the trainers who do that have to also improve their own qualification to learn new things to be able to teach the others and we are confident that a good trainer will provide uh, as a result a good seminar or training the research module this is a new uh, initiative this year. If we look at the topics, we understand that we need that. We all need to properly use the databases. And in our corporate culture, we have a principle that we have to help our teachers to uh, learn uh, how to use the databases and uh, so that the teachers know how to create profiles in the research gate, how to use the um, the various information from the internet and the uh, leadership module is a compulsory one. We know what leadership is and we are trying to improve the leadership skills uh, in teachers and also to nurture the students as leaders. And in our university, we carry out a poll which is, it has an aim. The teacher through the eyes of the students and the postgraduates. And if uh, when the teacher would like to aspire for a certain position or uh, will uh, fill in the register of the leader of the year, we carry out this polling uh, in regards of all the teachers. And uh, in this polling, we are asking about the qualities of a teacher, of a researcher from the point of view of the students. And here we are trying to find out to what extent the students are happy with the teacher and uh, 12 months ago we have identified the following phenomena several um, teachers quite a, a large number of teachers have obtained not a very good evaluation not too many scores and we understood the majority of those do not have any pedagogical education they are good economists they are good financial specialists and they are good in terms of their knowledge but they do not have pedagogical background these teachers uh, have difficulties in terms of delivering knowledge to the students and we created a special didactical module integrated it in other modules and we have carried out a very intensive course which is less than 30 hours for these teachers and after that we have polled the students again and their opinion changed and this case works and it is possible to do it for some target audience and these are the topics for the digital competencies and the management uh, is working to fill the gap uh, which we identified during the research so that there is access to technology and we also have to teach the teachers how to use this uh, technology and to use the approaches to e-education we are developing documentation and we as uh, the majority of the institutions issue the certificates in 2015 um, in 2016 we started to develop the uh, variation models and the university has uh, to provide some optional courses as well and there was a decree of the president of uh, ukraine yeah? and uh, the principle is 
the following. Actually, uh, there are a lot of opportunities to learn the foreign languages, but the university is located in various uh, areas, in various locations. The trainers, the teachers were coming to the location uh, where there was a need by the teachers to uh, learn the foreign language. And we wanted to arrange these courses on site. And we wanted the teachers not only to master their language skills, but also to be able to write the grant requests. And we were teaching foreign languages, and we started from 2016 to implement uh, the project management competency development. Uh, this is an ambitious uh, name for this project. Now we have to look at this competency uh, from a different angle and maybe to identify other opportunities to develop it. And uh, some of the teachers have increased their competency and uh, they started to participate in study tours. They were developing their grant applications, but that was very important for individual teachers. And this is a line of our case. You can see the uh, the provisions. Then we started to write the programs. The strategy of development was developed. And we developed the Center of Development of Personnel and Leadership. And this is what this center is working on. We have created this center. You can see that. And this is these are the questions they are working on. And uh, this is a case about the adaptation of the new stuff which is recruited to the university annually. And we have to introduce them into the uh, university environment. And this is, uh, these are the levels on which we are implementing it. And at present, we have uh, the tasks for the future, which are very topical. And they are important for all of us. And we are uh, confident that we will be able to cope with implementing these tasks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And now we are going to have some question for questions. Uh, Mr. Taras Dobko, the Vice Rector of the Ukrainian Catholic University, the first Vice Rector. Good afternoon, esteemed colleagues. Uh, and I am very grateful for an opportunity to share for an opportunity to share our case and make certain conclusions uh, which we have made after implementing a pilot project and uh, it lasted for three years. And uh, during this pilot project, we were trying, first of all, in our university to decide what are our major needs. Uh, where would you like to move? What are the goals uh, we are formulating for ourselves? And how we are going to attain those goals to support the teaching excellency and professional development uh, of the teachers. And we uh, made some mistakes and we had a lot of successes. And mistakes are also a very good way to extend the experience. We started from a very, very simple question, what for? We were not satisfied by the abstract answers. We wanted to understand what we would like to uh, do, which issues uh, we would like to address. Everything started in 2016 when at that time, especially in under Ukrainian circumstances, uh, a lot of discussions were waged on the issue of the development of alternatives in education, online education. And uh, there was a challenge. We felt that. And we are a university which, to a great extent, is uh, um, working within the concept of the direct face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction of teachers and students. And the issues of online education we uh, perceive as a real challenge. Now, whether the uh, uh, emergence of other providers of higher education uh, will be competitive or just the providers of services which are similar to higher education appear in the market. And during these years, we have got uh, uh, a lot of talented students and that's a huge incentive for the teachers and uh, they have to improve their knowledge and we have to provide the instruments of teaching uh, to our faculty and uh, so that the students 
students understand that, that the teachers are using the uh, new methods of teaching. And we are developing comprehensive um, you know, personalities of the students. And those teachers who are in the front line of working with the students, communicating with the students, are um, you know, developing, comprehensively developing our students. So they have to develop themselves as well. So the question was, how should we help such faculty, members of the faculty, to improve themselves? Also, choice of the courses. And this could be a manifestation of the competition between the uh, teachers. The student-centered environment is also one of our goals. And we cannot be excellent in all the aspects of our work. And we believe that we have a competitive advantage in the educational market of Ukraine. And we believe that these are bachelor's programs are our strong, our strengths. And we have to give more attention to teaching on the bachelor level. So what was the conclusion? Teaching uh, is very important. And the importance of a teacher as a pedagogue is going to increase. And in a small university like us, this will create a competitive advantage for us. And that's why it is quite worthwhile to invest into the professional development development of the teachers. If we would like to survive as a private university, we are not being financed by the state. And pedagogics as an art is very important in the education. And we need to provide the opportunities to provide professional development to the teachers. And this is our strategic priority. But the question uh, emerges. There could be resistance. There could be lack of understanding on the part of the faculty. So where's the entrance point for this pilot project has to be found? And naturally, we thought that maybe at this entrance po point, we have to create certain disruption. Uh, uh, he's looking for Ukrainian term of that. That is disruption of the existing practices so that people would not say we are doing quite well. What, what you would like us to do? And where would you like us to improve? So we ask the question, where? Where are the weak points of our professors and our faculty? This should be a entrance point. And also, what uh, the and we decided that electronic um, teaching would be that. Uh, entrance point. It was discussed a lot. The distance courses were discussed and the e-education was discussed a lot. And we decided that e-education, e-environment will create a little earthquake in our community, which will give us an opportunity to ask the question, what is a good teaching? And it will help to uh, make the faculty to think about the students' needs. And uh, this was the start of the pilot project, and we created the Center of Innovation and uh, Teaching Technologies. And uh, the goal was uh, to move in five directions within this center, creating electronic environment for the uh, courses uh, on the Moodle basis, uh, implementation of the mixed methodologies of teaching, development of the information literacy, digital literacy, and this is our priority. This year as well, and creating the basis, the foundation for the teaching excellence and professional development of the faculty. It's not new for the Ukrainian university to create the electronic environment. There are a lot of universities who've, uh, uh, who've moved quite uh, far ahead uh, with this issue. It was important for us to create a culture, and we were able to do that. A big achievement was that when we created certain rules of the game, which are designed described in the provisions for electronic courses and we we started to implement uh, all these things uh, on a basic level and uh, in-depth level. We still do not have any single certified course of the um, deep of a higher level. We should not make haste. We are developing this culture um, slowly without excessive acceleration. Development of such courses and working in the electronic environment became part of the contract of the, uh, with the faculty and the component for their attestation when we are extending their contracts. So there were in, uh, well, bonuses which will encourage the students to work it, uh, the, the faculty to work it. Also, we had to upgrade the 
this system to make it student and teacher friendly so they would be uh, easily using it and we invested a lot of resources to do it mixed education i cannot say that we have moved far in this area in this direction but we've created a very good thing we have 18 19 professors we have only 200 50, 250 full-time equivalent of teachers who participate in various activities, but at least, well, less than 10% of the faculty uh, acquired the skills to teach the others, and they have become role models. And we um, consider them to be the early adapters of these new approaches. And we have developed the materials in electronic form, and we have the uh, the course on electronic didactics and mixed uh, training and education, uh, which is accessible to all the teachers. And actually, it's built in the style of mixed uh, teaching uh, and an international cooperation was very useful for us. And I'm going to dwell upon it a little bit later. And. Uh, at present, we are working on digital literacy, and this is a priority for us this year. And we are approaching it not top down, but we are uh, identifying the people who are prepared to implement interactive multimedia projects. And we, the center provides a support to them. And the projects uh, all appear to be quite good, and they attract other uh, teachers and it's like a carrot which we should demonstrate what is possible to achieve while implementing these new approaches to development of these courses there are several multimedia projects which have been developed on the center of our center the media communication and the media communication, and that was the project about Plastony, the youth organization of Ukraine. For two years, we are implementing already the program of the School of Teaching Excellence. It has five credits, and similar to what my colleague described, and it has several parts to it. There is a, a, a obligatory program and compulsory program and variative component and optional course, and the phase of reflection. It's very important for us to close this circle uh, so that or, or the loop so that people can reflect on what they have learned and then use it in their practical experience uh, work. And uh, we involve uh, pro uh, experts from Kiev Mohila Academy. Ms. Lyudmila Krivaruchka was proactively helping us to implement this program. And uh, well, international cooperation was very wholesome to us. Uh, with the McEwen University, uh, we created created the uh, teacher's seminar in Lviv with the British Council with the program of development of leadership potential. And uh, well, actually, we had a project in this area. And we, together with the expert from the British University from London, uh, will uh, f to work on the ship. And part of those uh, is about $700 to $1,000 to be spent on professional development of teachers. And an individual decides herself or himself where this money should be in invested and the study tours uh, and are very important we had a study tour in uh, the, the colleges of the united states and it was dedicated to tapping on the experience of professional development and teaching and we are planning to carry out a similar um, study tours to france the service is a very important aspect they say that the student uh, uh, learns a lot when they are trying to teach uh, somebody else. And we uh, value very much the sharing of exp um, the experience. We carry out for uh, annually, uh, well, uh, the forum is called CREATE for 200, 250 teachers. And also we collect the best practices of uh, individual teachers. And the fact that they share this experience is very important. We've made another conclusion. We started to implement and we are preparing the implementation of the uh, society oriented uh, education. Uh, this is a special pedagogy which we uh, selected as a key one for the development of our uh, university. It's known as a service learning program and we would like to make it uh, 
overarching all the programs of the university and an autonomous group of the teachers is working on a horizontal level. We as the uh, vice rectors and the deans are not uh, working in this group. They have to work on the proposals themselves. But this uh, quote is very important for us. Uh, some universities believe that they exist to improve and achieve their uh, academic excellence. But we believe that the reason for, be for existing of our university is to serve people. And academic excellence is the best tool to achieve this. And this is the philosophy we preach and we would like to implement into life. And we are already starting to do that. The conclusions of the pilot project, the faculty understood that the center is working not for its own sake. This is a tool and this is the assistance, the tool which assists them. And this is a big win when we were able to uh, to develop the trust uh, uh, on the part of the faculty. It was important to create a product of this center, not to be only a service center, but to be a center which create the ideas and the senses to, uh, to orient ourselves uh, on the work of uh, the best teachers, and they will help others to leave the comfort zone. In the new strategy, which we have approved in September, and it was approved by our supervisory board, and we have 10 strategic goals. Two of them are going to have a direct impact on the professional development of the teachers. One of them is the best teachers for the best students and the university which serves the people. And the strategic goals for us uh, are mm, being transformed in the task of the university to become one of the leading expert centers uh, for encouraging uh, the teaching excellence in Ukraine to become the uh, the uh, student-centered university. We are concentrated on the value of the bachelor's programs. Uh, especially also the pedagogy and socially oriented approach. So finishing up, it is going to require from us the following step, namely the creation of a whole ecosystem and culture for the support and encouragement of high-quality teacher. We don't know how to do it yet. We have a discussion ahead of us. And what kind of steps should we make so that it happens? But for us, it is clear. Institutionally, we have to create a center of the support for teaching and learning, which is going to be focused not only on the technologies, but also on other elements which influence the professional development of teachers and which will strengthen the teaching excellence. And therefore, this sixth point is very important strengthening and creating horizontal interdisciplinary autonomous teams. Another team is now working on the proposals for the whole university, which are going to be reviewed at the student council and directed how do you reward high quality and excellent teaching. And finally, also the pedagogy of socially oriented uh, training at all study programs to uh, more uh, to bigger or smaller instead this amount the strategic uh, task of the university thank you for your attention thank you and finally now we give the floor to you there are questions and answers I wanted to actually make a very small comment. There are three very different and interesting, yeah, interesting but very different presentations. And obviously, even now, we have something to fill up platform best practices. So, please, your questions. Uh, thank you for presentation, dear colleagues. I'm Anton Pantelimonov from Kharkiv Karasi University. I have a somewhat provocative question. We have been thinking about serving students and uh, teaching in the, through the eyes of students and all that. What if from year to year, day to day, one and the same teacher shows that he or she doesn't grow professionally? He or she is on the same level that they used to be, on a low level. Do you have practices of this kind of 
staff conclusions for such teachers. Thank you. Well, the question is extremely provocative, that's true, because I represent a state university. Well, it's probably the simplest and the most difficult to say that current legislation, unfortunately, doesn't have such influence, instrument of influence. We treat it as academic integrity at the chair or the department or the research council of the university or the lack of the such integrity. Another example is uh, within last month at our research council, we had an issue uh, of elections of a very complicated department. There were two candidates, the current head of chair and another candidate. And the research council of the university voted not the way uh, the department voted by recommending the people. And they actually voted based on the reports of both candidates about the development strategy for the chair. These strategies are published on the research council uh, website, but not everybody reads that. When there was a report there, uh, this sold, the issue was solved by secret vote. But this is a very, very rare case, because I would totally agree with the provocative nature of your question. Presently, uh, there are no formal legal instruments like that. We have several instruments, let's say. The first step that we take, for example, uh, how do we react if the teacher gets low marks from the students and not from just one group, for example, from several groups and for a year, for example, when we are summing up the yearly results. The first task of the head of chair is to reflect on that, to try to understand what is happening, why is it happening. Uh, the second step is we put in the task for the following academic year for this teacher to attend these events or at least a part of the events which I have demonstrated. So the, we are obliged at present to do that. This is actually you know, even written in our work contract because every year every teacher has to put some goals which in the end of the year have to be checked then whether these goals have been achieved. And uh, this can become the reason if this uh, goals can be achieved even for, for example, uh, early termination of contract. This is not easy, uh, but we had situations like that several times. Of course, uh, that was uh, very worrying because, I mean, there is no easy way with our legislation here. Thank you and to the colleagues. Thank you for the question. It is uh, very relevant. I'm not going to repeat what my colleagues have said, but we have experience that, yes, first uh, at the chair or the department, we this, they work with this teacher. They provide recommendations to remove with the help of trainings, for example, which you propose to seminars. But you have to understand that, oh, yes, we have to give that person a chance, but when inside the team. There is already this philosophy working that still the opinion of the student is very important. If the student actually puts less than three points to this teacher first, such teachers, if they don't have academic degree or want to have a research degree, they cannot even be candidates for that before they improve the assessment by the students. It is done in practice. Just the same every teacher. Uh, we already understand that, but each teacher uh, has uh, this contract actually finished sooner or later. And then from the impact of Ukraine Catholic University, there can be a contract for one year, for two years, but with a clear understanding that this has to be removed. Because otherwise, if we don't react to that, we are just hostages to the situation whether the students go to us. If they don't go to us, What's the point of our existence then? That's why we're working on that. 
regardless of imperfect legislation because if we want to talk about that and not work out some internal policies it is very hard to move at least somewhere thank you thanks a lot are there any more questions Oleg Lutsishin Uh, Ternopil National Economic University, Institute of Creative Studies. Just to support Anton, I'm going to say the following. How do you balance in the triangulating this issue? Uh, first of all, professional requirements, student appreciation, and also the wish to obtain the highest points. Uh, sometimes we see a paradox, at least in our university, that the teacher who is very demanding, we know that he is demanding. And sometimes in the cool hours and not even or even very openly the students uh, might write to the rector, to the vice rectors and everyone and we react to that. And we promote this corporate culture and everything. They complain that the teachers very demanding, but when in the end of the year we see this, we see that they get rather high points because objectively, uh, and if it's fair, fair and demanding teacher, an adult always understands that. I mean, a critically thinking person. Oh, naturally, even among adults and students, there is a different percentage of uh, various people. Don't they won't always appreciate? But we are talking about the system as a rule. Students un understand the subjective demands when the teacher gives knowledge and the skills which the student needs for professional development. Yes, they might get offended or hurt sometimes, but still they would assess them. Because the questions uh, are just put in a way that he would have to confirm that he gives knowledge. Well, we start reacting, especially when the marks are, sh are too high from most students. Then this is a problem. If there is no intelligent distribution, I mean, we are not really uh, want to, to have this uh, really matching the recommendations exactly but if this is happening then some there is a problem there may be a situation which you have just described and then in this case we have to look in the context of not just one course i'm just trying to remember whether we had cases when a person uh, reading five, four, or four, four or five courses, there were negative emphasis was everywhere. I don't remember such cases, but if it really happened, then it would be a signal for us, a serious one. If if it's 50-50, then mostly it's conversations. We have to find out what happened. But then, we, of course, we're not uh, saying that this is an alarm, that there is some manipulation happening from one or the other side. And so here, you know, there isn't a, a rule that you can apply. You just have common sense working here. Well, it's easier for me because we're a very big university and we do not apply quantitative criteria for the students. And in this way, we avoid ranking teachers based on student surveys because presently, I'll just provide an easy example. You can look at the website of the university. There is an annual report from the rector, and there is uh, something about culture assessment. Even within one department, two chairs can be different, both in workload and in the marks put. Uh, my colleague, Andrei, actually really likes this. Uh, at his, at the final exams, and at which uh, specialties and which departments within one department. Yeah. What are the deviations from the arithmetic mean in the evaluation culture? So what then, what then we can say about such evaluation? So normally, we analyze it as a, for education, monitoring, but based on the internal university evaluation, we actually make a selection like that. This, if there are some radical deviations from the way the teacher evaluates the students. And the students from the whole group and the specialty, all teachers have uh, have formulas. And for example, only one teacher puts like very uh, high, much higher, much low. For example, we have one chair in uh, mechanics and math. 
uh, they put 120 Fs for 130 students. That's how they teach the mathematical analysis, let's say. So then we analyzed, and there was a meeting of rector with the chair to explain to them and they have hours for independent work of students not to not to train the students during the exam or the passing but so that you actually work in that so this is just our experience and our departments will have special treatment for evaluation of uh, s teachers by students in quantity parameters. As for qualitative service, we do that all the time. Our sociology department, the uh, sociology lab does it. But to avoid ranking, because it's very conditional, because the departments are very different. Like the same sociology department, which has 400 students, and there are four chairs, and there would be the Institute of Philology, where there are three and a half thousand students and 30 chairs. Mm. Institute of Philology, where there is the English language chair, and there is Polish language chair. This is also a difference. So, to some extent, we take up this mission ourselves and this quality service. We also have sociologists and student parliament helping us. Student parliament, student council. Uh, you, s you saw that on the scheme that we're working with them so that they actually have this culture of research and assessment because honestly, they really help us do it the best. I just remembered one important thing, just a small comment for me. We have now started looking at what they say in English, at dropout rates. And we believe that it is too high in our university. Uh, about 20, per, it might reach 20%. That's one way I took, I mean, in the States, they also measure it's important. If, for example, after four years and after one year, the dropout, so after four years, and now we start collecting those data and actually we do surveys and we ask each student uh, who was expelled to understand why, why, what was the exact reason. Whether the person just understood that it's not her, uh, not, uh, does not her think and we were unable to identify it in time, or there was some other motivation. Or maybe they cannot pay for the studies anymore. Or maybe because they study and they study badly, they just cannot you know, do, deal with the load. But we don't have enough data to actually draw any conclusions. Yes, please. Yuri Skiba from the Institute of Higher Education. I have a question for Volodymyr. I analyzed your presentation. I see that the university pays a lot of attention to improving the qualifications of different types of teachers and researchers, but improving the qualification of teaching and learning in these five years, I haven't seen any of that. So I have a question. Do you have such high level of uh, teaching uh, competence, or you just don't have qualified trainers to at least see some improvement? Thank you, that's a good question. Thank you for noticing. Well, actually, we have documented this problem, but here there is another special thing to note. And uh, at this point, it was our strategic thing. If you have seen that for medical people, uh, that was really the deductive comp competences. The problem, not the, the problem, it's just that presently the question is the following. According to our chair department analysis, 90 percent uh, of university staff have pedagogical qualifications. In my in my diploma, for example, it's written philosopher and teacher philosophy. I had two years of pedagogy, two semesters of methodology. I also practiced as an assistant, and I also in postgraduate education I did that. So we have a collision that today in our doctoral studies. For PhD students, we do work out this. So presently, the picture starts changing. So presently, we have professional qualifications of those who are in our research, and many of them without any pedagogical components. The our mechanical and math department used to give math teacher. Uh, physical department just the same physics teacher presently unfortunately for some time 
has been lost. And it's very good that uh, with Ms. Grunevich as minister, we had the return to that because presently the guarantors of study programs are just the teachers. And everybody's fighting for professional qualifications, and very often it is done at the expense of pedagogical qualifications and competences. So that is why for the following five years we have programmed it as a goal. At that stage, it's just we're doing it on the basis of research, but at that stage there wasn't such a relevant problem like that. There was a relevant problem, and I think it wasn't just for us to administer it all. Because just a simple example, two weeks ago we had a working subgroup, commission attached to well, legal reform and this subgroup on reform in legal education. The head of the subgroup is Professor Kuznetsova. I think the lawyers know that this is a much respected person in the field. And the, the group had deans of uh, leading legal departments of Ukraine, so legal business, research, and we were also invited to participate. And uh, we the deans of uh, the departments of law, we, we are saying that the practitioners uh, did not have this component, but we also found out that there was no administration between the professional standards and academic standards, and we wondered how to develop this approach. In Ukraine, there are a lot of people who can administer educational programs and other things, but unfortunately, this is uh, uh, quite exaggerated uh, at present. So. During this period of time when the law on higher education was passed and we talked about the new ideology of developing the educational process, the, for us the challenge was administering this educational process. And last year the scientific board of the university recommended the, the offered the new strategy for the next five years and this issue was uh, uh, the focus of this strategy and uh, we started uh, to move along the new trajectory on this issue starting from the previous year and thank you very much for make making this comment and we are going to pay uh, more attention to these things but we also are going to pay enough attention to the administration to administering the programs alviv regional institute professor drobat and um, i have the following question uh, it's the question to Mr. Taras. In your report, you mentioned that you are using the following approach. The students select, select what or whom? The professor, the teacher, or the discipline? Because if they, they choose the discipline, then it's quite understandable that they choose it to actually uh, achieve the goals for specialization in first and sp in certain speciality if they are choosing the professor so how they do that uh, well if there is a similar practice in other um, universities please share it with us the students are using the disciplines or the teachers thank you for the question we are talking here about the choice of the discipline but we do not limit this choice to the questions of specialized disciplines uh, teaching disciplines uh, t no, we have several like three layered uh, system or even four layered the system of uh, a choice by the students the first layer is the program of uh, the nucleus of uh, the perception of the world for all the batch bachelors outlook a uh, program which has the following components blocks like for example the world and myself the universe and myself the people uh, and myself then there is a, uh, the um, uh, the the god and me and uh, there is an introduction in the university studies and there are no mandatory courses and disciplines but the students have to choose six credits 
and to get six credits on each block. Uh, that is, they, the, uh, in other words, they have to choose two disciplines. And in each semester, in each block, we offer six, seven, eight courses, which are delivered by various professors and uh, teachers. And uh, the students are choosing various disciplines. And thus, they choose the uh, teacher as well. And if the group is being shaped up, formed, then this teacher cannot read this course. And his workload is going to be less. And this might even um, affect his or her salary. The second level is uh, about the following. The university offers the optional courses. Uh, on the part of the university, we offer these courses. And uh, the student has to choose one of those optional courses for one semester. We do it so that uh, usually it happens that the uh, it's we give this opportunity at the second, third, and fourth year students. And we give an opportunity to the students to work in the mixed audiences so that certain courses will consolidate the students of various directions, computer sciences, social work, philology. So these courses are kind of directed. They are not narrow specialized. They are mostly developed to the soft skill development. But it's very important for us to bring together the various students from various educational programs. And the third level is the free optional courses, free choice at the level of the department where these courses uh, are more specialized, but nevertheless, they are not very narrow. At the humanitarian, the the faculty, the Department of Humanities, where the historians uh, and culturologists uh, uh, are studying, these are humanitarian sciences, and they might become the uh, basis for their specialization to comply with the conditions. And the fourth level and layer is when the students choose the specialized direction, and this is another uh, way to choose both the course and the teacher. Thank you very much. And the last question could be asked now. Vice Rector of the Prikarpatsky National University, uh, Helena Michalishin. My question is the following. I, I would be happy to share my experience, but we do not have this opportunity. And uh, uh, for qualification improvement, it is possible to use the grant activities financed by the grants. We have colleagues here of the MOPED project where we, for the first, for the first uh, in Ukrainian history have become the grant holders of the European project. And thank you very much for the support. And we have a great opportunity to provide these services in terms of improvement of qualification. We have created an innovation center. And maybe you will be interested in our university and its work here. We have a hub as a result of this project implementation. We have a center of agents of changes where we teach people how to prepare the projects. And But I have a question on the issues we were discussing. Well, the first question, we know that in the universities, usually people uh, uh, are recognized in terms of the scientific internships, uh, well, face-to-face -face or extramural. And maybe the pedagogical um, skills improvement uh, could be done in the pedagogical universities. But we are not a classical university. So how do you mm, mm, uh, consider this scientific internship as uh, uh, as uh, a way to improve the pedagogical qualification. And the pedagogical qualification could be provided uh, within the framework of other educational programs. Uh, and uh, what about uh, the uh, law on uh, the higher education um, amendments without educational specializations within the educational program? This is what it reads. Can we? Uh, uh, consider that uh, the uh, teacher of maths could be a um, you know, professor, lecturer, or uh, the teacher. So I will start from the first question you've raised. We uh, accept whatever. And thank, uh, due to the uniqueness of our university, we have 
within our university two or even three departments. This is Ukrainian physics and mathematics lyceum and geological and uh, optical, physics opt optical, uh, where we are training this stuff. And uh, we have uh, quite a unique experience. We send we send our teachers to improve their qualification uh, to the uh, Department of Management uh, of uh, the University of Pedagogical uh, uh, Ac Academy of Pedagogical Sciences. And up to the present, uh, we cannot uh, provide uh, the courses of improvement of qualification. We already had uh, uh, discussions with the auditing service uh, well, about these issues. For the researchers uh, and the scientific personnel, uh, we are sending them for internships uh, to the pedagogical educational establishments, uh, but we have a department of pedagogics uh, and uh, pedagogical um, specialities in the educational sciences exist in our university. As for the second question, I would like uh, to ask Evgeny to answer it as one of the authors. I am the member of the working group, and I can tell you that uh, this wording has been changed in the the uh, amendments to the law and less emphasis is put on it. It reads that this one educational program uh, is equal to one specialization. It is uh, not possible to uh, require several specializations within w the framework of one pro program, but it gives an opportunity to provide the professional qualification of the teacher. But this is going to be regulated by the subsidiary legislation and regulations, and they will spell out how to do it. In my case, you've mentioned philosophy. Yeah, in my case, this is just a case of pedagogical competency because philosopher, the teacher, the researcher uh, uh, unites all these aspects and our department of philosophy gives an opportunity to teach in this way and we develop our curriculum in this way. But very few people choose the academic career uh, in comparison with what happened when I uh, was graduating. A lot of graduates of ours are working as ambassadors, uh, the members of the parliament uh, of Ukraine. Uh, so there are various uh, options. Uh, dear colleagues, um, unfortunately, uh, well, we have exhausted the time which was allocated for our fourth session. I would like to thank our speakers for extremely interesting reports and very good answers. And thank you very much for your proactive participation. I also had a number of provocative questions, but but I w I'm going to ask them during a coffee break. Dear colleagues, while we are changing the format of uh, our sessions, I would like to thank you very much for working so well. And we still have a cherry on a cake. Uh, Svetlana Kalashnikov and myself have an experience of presenting the program, so we hope that we will be able to do it within 20 minutes' time. And I will start, and Ms. Svetlana is going to follow up and continue. We are going to introduce to you a new program. And after we complete this presentation, if you will have additional questions, uh, we will be answering them during coffee. And we would like to invite you for another cup of coffee. And the name of the program, Program of Improvement of Teaching in the Higher Education of Ukraine System. It's a very serious name and title, and it's, it's really true. We've discussed that so much today, but the working name of this program in English is Teaching Excellence Program teaching and learning excellence program. And by the way, we have a, a great tool such as slides, and we would like to caucus with you and use the strong intellectual potential of this audience. Oh, please think on this question and give us your proposals either today or you will be able to send them later. Just a, a, a offer us a, your version of uh, of the name of this program. Uh, you can do it on the slides or just think about it. Maybe there will be a good idea. 
I am not saying that we are going to prepare the rewards, but if this uh, name you are going to suggest uh, is going to be used, maybe we will even reward you for that. Partners of the program, we discussed the partners and we talked a lot about the partnership. The British Council in Ukraine is a partner. Institute of Higher Education of the National Academy of Pedagogical Sciences of Ukraine has a huge experience of cooperation with the British Council in the leadership program. And we've heard about the excellent experience of the Agency for Advanced HIE and uh, the agency which is dealing with the issues of the pro professional development, professional standards of the teachers uh, and faculty. And the program of Ukraine is going to be implemented with the help of the Ministry of Education and Science and National Agency for Quality Assurance uh, of Education. And uh, that's me. Uh, who cannot operate the slides. Not only Yulia, but myself also cannot operate it. A goal of the program, I think that it is absolutely transparently worded and uh, it's very ambitious. We we acknowledge that when we are talking about the improvement of the quality of education, we would like to do it with the help of the developing institutional capacity of the universities in terms of teaching and learning. And the program is going to be launched this year. And this forum is the first activity within this program in this year, in 2019, and we are the program is going to last until 2021. 30 universities, we've mentioned that at the beginning, and Simon did that. And within the first year, we start to, uh, cooperating with the 10 universities, but 30 is the number which we aspire to achieve. And uh, the program is going to have several levels, national level, institutional level, and we are talking also about the individual level because we are going to work with the teachers, trainers, uh, and uh, this will uh, mean that we will be working on individual level as well. And um, the outcomes of the program. Today, we were discussing it as well, and we've heard from the teachers uh, with whom we were communicating and discussing, and we've heard the development and creation of the national platform for the special uh, discussion, specialized discussions and the exchange of best practices are very important. We still continue uh, discussing what format will be the most acceptable, what we will be able to offer in terms of online platforms, but forum, and we decided that, that it's uh, going to be I face-to-face -face forum and December is a good time to carry out those fora and we will think about the awards we can distribute uh, on these foras and also creating a network of teachers is very important we are talking not only about the teachers but also managerial stuff of the university uh, well I checked whether the managerial staff has a positive connotation and I was persuaded that it is a positive connotation we are talking about people about the team the teams of the university and Svetlana, uh, when she is going to tell you how to apply, uh, well, she will tell you that we would like to see the team of the university, which is going to implement changes and institutional uh, development projects. And we are ready to support implementation of such institutional projects uh, uh, for improving of learning and uh, education and uh, teaching. And how this program is going to work to look like. We would like to see the university teams, and we are talking here about the component for the teachers and the managerial stuff. I understand that you're, well, why you are taking these pictures, but don't do that. We are going to place all these presentations and materials on our site. But on the 10th of December, we are going to provide very detailed information about this program with the, uh, with the uh, forms uh, which are to be filled, with all the requirements, information um, letter. And it's going to be on the site of the British Council and uh, the sites of our partners. Uh, today, we are in the 4th of December. I'm going to reveal a secret to you. We are trying 
to discuss in more detail all the components and the content of the components of this project. And we are going to work with Julia tomorrow. And we are working with the Institute. We are engaging the universities to this work. We are discussing what could work and what cannot work, uh, because this is a big, serious program, and it's uh, expensive, and we would like it to be very effective and to hit the target. And uh, as for the component for the teachers, uh, well, we mean that three teachers from which university can participate in this program, but these are potential trainers. They are going to be taught, trained on a very serious level. We discussed it with our partners from the Advanced HE. And when the British Council is planning the programs, we never copy the British experience and British versions. And we, together with Ian, started to discuss these issues when Ian was, Ian was the working for the Higher Education Academy. And we were looking at the possible modules, the programs uh, to be certified, and we we uh, learned that there are three modules. We looked what is the content of those modules. Everything is being discussed in great detail. But we consider that this is a very serious uh, engagement uh, which has to be taken by the teachers. They have to study one module within four days, then next modules uh, for the next four days, work between the modules, participate in webinars, uh, uh, communicate with the British mentors. And this is a very serious workload. And we expect that the trainers, uh, we consider and we understand that life might, uh, you know, introduce certain adjustments. Uh, and if you multiply 30 universities by three uh, teachers, well, we expect that approximately 100 trainers are going to be trained within the framework of our program. As for the component for the managers, we write one person. Who could be that person? That could be somebody who really is responsible for that direction of the university. It, should, it mustn't be a rector. It could be a vice rector as well. This is a two-day training, and this is the more strategic thing. This is a training. It is a more about the discussion of institutional strategy, whether it exists, whether it doesn't, which changes can be made. But we also see that this is a team that's working on the institutional project on improving teaching, teaching excellence. Okay, and this is a technical thing. This only Yulia could do it so well. Here you see the timeline of the program. So, call for applications between the 20th of December, 6th of uh, January. We understand this New Year, Christmas, but we have to move on. And you're also going to see that we have a rather long term for that. And it's not because it's very hard um, as an application. It's just that we give ourselves time to carefully select these 10 universities that are going to participate in the program. And also, to do the interviews, to see at their level of English, to test. So, I mean, there are lots of tasks ahead of us, but uh, we took up the obligation almost, uh, uh, it's going to be, uh, to be on the 2nd of March when we announce the results. We are very ambitious about the first module for teachers. We plan to do that in the end of March. And uh, April and June, April, that's, that means two months of very active work for teachers and the second module is going to be in the end of June. When we say training for managers, it doesn't mean that we are going to invite one person from the university. We plan to invite really one manager, but we also plan to invite one teacher from the cohort of teachers in the university, a person who will be able to look at the development of the plan and what's going to be happening in the university already from the side of the teacher and the proposition that they have already made it through the modules and is a certified trainer whether the scheme is going to work or not and will also give an opportunity to the university to add one more person who quite possibly will be dealing with the practical support of these teachers then monitoring seminars, mentorship, 
and also a new forum. I hope it's going to be in December 2020. And now I'll give the floor to Svetlana, but I'm here next next to her, and if necessary, I'll join. So the requirements. As Ludmila said, on the 10th of December, we are going to open call for applications, and we are going to see the form. But now we are, can already see the key requirements. As for the participants of the team, the teachers. And the, it is a serious change if we compare the requirements on leadership program. This is due to the specifics of uh, the program and the possibility uh, of further certification. You see that there is English la language uh, B2 no less. When we are going to collect the applications, when we analyze first the, the applications, first the teams which get into the shortlist, why we have this long term between the 26th of January until the 2nd of March. During this period, we are going to do the phone interviews. If need be, we might also meet uh, the applicants, and these people are also going to pass the test of the British Council to confirm their B2 level in English. That is a significant change. So this requirement to know English, a teaching experience no less than five years, active use of innovational methods, and readiness to share knowledge. In the forum itself, already have it. It's just that we want to also align it with our British colleagues. But I can say that as for the teachers, except uh, the noted questions, we are going to locate some very specific questions like. What is your motivation to participate in the program? Uh, write, please write two or three important achievements which are important for successful participation. Also, please describe one uh, teaching method that you successfully use in your practice. If we talk a little bit about the risks in our three-year experience of analyzing the questionnaires, I would also like to ask you to be as uh, specific as possible. You remember that. We always require that. The questionnaires with just uh, general words are going to be a waste, a little chance to get in. We really need your specific information so that we saw the picture of the program. It is very important strategically and in terms of values, and we want to identify the people who are going to take the most out of it. Uh, so that's about the teachers also. Uh, the teachers are going to be obliged, those who will study in our program, to attend all in-person sessions. Of course, force majeures may happen, but these are really force majeures. And when you apply the team, please also look at the dates that were noted when there are trainings, so that we then don't get into a situation when, for example, a person has applied but cannot attend because the obligatory requirements about the in-person part of the visit and also the online. Uh, and uh, in the final stage, uh, associated with own project, also trainings for university teachers and trainings for external teachers. Then the best ones that are going to pass the teaching, they are going to uh, consider, be considered this master trainings of national level, and we're going to work with them for their own. As for the managers, here the requirement about English is lacking. That is, that's a good sign if it's there. It's going to be an additional bonus. And in this part, actually, they have a somewhat different ambitious task is to take up an obligation to actually have that. So it's to ensure the support university in its implementation. And because uh, as for the requirements for the managers, I mean, if we still ask about the level of English in the questionnaire, but still, this is not going to be the criterion of acceptance. We're also going to ask about the motivation of the manager and his or her two or three personal achievements. But what's the most important in this part is the project that the team applies with. That is a questionnaire except the data about the teachers. 
and also uh, the managers, I mean, and teachers. It's uh, very, very similar to the questionnaire that we filled out. When we had leadership program, is also going to contain a small uh, block about inf with information about the project. And this part, I want to immediately say, the projects can be different. You've seen today only three cases, and you see that the different universities are on totally different levels. That is, there can be a case associated with the first steps about teaching excellence. Maybe there could be some advanced step. Maybe there could be an exit to a strategy uh, solution for the university. Maybe also creating a center of excellence in the university. This is totally your decision. We do not require the same from the university to develop this uh, strategy, strategy. We really want to have specific relation with the university development with its level and with its further steps that have to be taken. And that's why in this part and the position of this manager as a representative of the leadership team from the university is to help as much as possible for the, this project's realization because this project is a part for this team participation. The program is going to be continued. We are now only presenting the first part. As I said, as Mila was saying, we are going to have a second block for institutional support of the universities. That is, we are going to keep working, but the transfer to the second stage is only possible if you successfully complete the first stage, and you understand all that. So the teams which successfully passed that and studied that, we are now going to move on with them for a specific institution, a specific university. So this is the general picture. Uh, so, in 10th of December, we are going to put up a competition, a questionnaire. We are going to do consulting in the institute, additionally for work, and we are interested in high-quality questionnaires, like we did all the previous years. We are going to uh, have as many as possible uh, of these questionnaires, and so that we bring all our effort into institutional capacity of universities, our mission and uh, Ludmilla, I invite you to the floor uh, and if there are any questions we are ready to answer those yes questions we still have a little bit of time while you're thinking about the questions I'll say yet again that the presentations are on the website of the British Council forum page on the 10th of December on the website of the Institute the British Council if you follow Facebook, uh, our Facebook page and the photos, today's photos you've seen we had a uh, Alexander Filoninko who is a professional photographer. He is here waving to us and even now we're going to find out whether we're going to have a family photo. But for now, some different things. So all pictures are going to be in Flickr of the British Council of good quality. I know that you made your photos, but look at ours as well. So the ribbons we have uh, prepared this is the beginning of our program. You are going to uh, get used to it, and it's, today is the first day. But I ask you, if 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 you don't take them off of the following four, you can leave them. But if you don't really need it, you might leave it here, and then we're going to reuse them. I know that we can answer questions online and through a webinar and in general. But we almost have made it by time, and I only have those thank yous left, but if there are any questions, yes, there are questions. Hello, I'm Tatiana Kostin at the uh, uh, Tavriski National U uh, University. Can the head of chair be considered a manager for your project? Yes. Uh, additional to the questionnaire, there is going to be a support letter from the rector. That's also an obligatory requirement where you are going to indicate that the university supports this team. In particular, this person applies as a manager. Even if it's just the level of the chair, he or she is going to perform institutional function. So that's the decision of the university. I also forgot to say one thing here and allow me to just stress that it's very important so that these three teachers are not from the same department. 
and then it just means that just one department of the university goes there and we are not going to consider that. It's very important to have the representatives of different departments and chairs because we work for the whole university. Irina Shkurai from the Eflat Nobel University. Have I understood correctly that you can apply with the team of teachers and separately the managers? No. It's the three plus one team. It's one team. You know, we understand and we have always discussed that with our partners, the British partners here in the leadership program as well, you can train the people but hoping that they will uh, move uh, that all forward is very hard. So it should be trained, prepared, trained, but also teach people in the universities who are going to support them, for sure. It's not going to be efficient, but we want to have an efficient program. There is one more position, reserve one. There is one more part where you can submit one reserve person if there are some changes happening, if something happens like that. And when Ludmilla showed this a schedule of trainings where there is this training for teachers, just as she said, the manager comes to the training, somebody of these three teachers who has already passed that, uh, had the training and maybe one person additionally, yes, but we are going to, we couldn't just show it all in the presentation, but we are going to have informational letter and all the details are going to be written down there. Yes, but the team is three plus one. One more question then from Tavriski National University. Is there the num yes, just one application from one university? Yes, it was like that. And please coordinate the issue on the level of universities because we are not going to look at the second application as soon as the first arrives. And still, it seems to me that when you receive this letter of support from the rector, the rector has to decide which project he or she is going to support. We don't hope to get five le support letters from one director, right? Okay, colleagues, I think that we have worked very fruitfully and I'm very thankful to you. Such undivided attention and and such a prizing, it's something that I haven't seen for a long time. I'm very impressed. And I'm also convinced now that this topic that we have selected is probably very, very important. Thanks to you for the participation in the forum. Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks to our partners. Thanks to our online audience. And I know that today we had constant work. That it's not like people who turned it on and just off. 50 to 60 people were constantly following the whole forum and they also asked questions. I would also like to thank the team of the British Council. We have Yulia Sobolev, also Havita Svetlishna Haydn here, who was dealing with all the presentations. We have Anastasia, who was showing these great tables. That only the speakers are two minutes and then and then no go. But this worked. We also had uh, a representative of the Institute of Higher Education happening in Nain Ola. We had fantastic interpreters today and I know that for sure because I have heard many different interpreters but I know that work with the best ones so thanks on the Ivan Zaitz. Thanks to the speakers, everyone who was with us. Some of them have left, but those who have remained, thanks for your time. Thank you for preparing the presentations and sharing your experience. And and now the new program is officially opened. And the very, very last thing, Alexander proposes to have a family photo. I don't know if it's going to be good on that background. No? Just like the audience is. Okay. Managers, we can do this family photo, really. 
and actually is uh, and this so how we're gonna do it I would ask the first three rows to take the chairs away the and the others should approach as close as possible so that I could take a picture of you from the stage In the stage.